Demigo Ryan spoke to the media on Monday following the Saturday night loss to the Ravens, which was a collective kick in the nargs to all of us, whether we have nargs or not, metaphorical nargs, you know. As usual, I will try to recap the questions since it's almost impossible to hear them. Uh, how do you feel about the future of the organization a couple days later? I feel good about our you know, our season and what we were able to accomplish. Uh, so I told our guys today, just be proud of what we were able to do. This league is a, a year-to-year business, right? And just always embrace the moments that you have with the, the people that you're around because as we know, right, teams change, right, staff change, a lot of change happens on a year-to-year basis. So just embrace that, right, live in the now, and but really be proud of what you what we were able to accomplish this year. Uh, you know, moving into, you know, the future and next year, we, you know, we like where we are with the young nucleus of guys that we have. I feel like we have a, a good group to build off of, and we still have to add more pieces. You're always adding and always looking to – acquire talent and get better and that's where we'll look to spend our off season right how who can we find to help us you know get better uh, you know uh, somebody reached out to me yesterday and said hey seth uh, in one of the comments that you know there's all these other teams in the afc that are probably going to be really good next year too and they were it, it seemed like they were kind of pessimistic about it that's life in the nfl you know like every given year uh, hey the jaguars had a lot of momentum at the end of last season and what did that accomplish for them you know the ravens the ravens are freaking awesome obviously they got a lot of guys that are the you know, free agents at the end of the year they're not going to be able to retain all of them so it's always not to get too existential about this stuff but like a football team is always like a constantly shifting you know organism almost <laughs> the cells are always replacing each other you you the the listener the viewer you're not the same person you were one day ago you've had parts of you swapped out so there you go stardust and whatnot if you had to pick a highlight from the season what would be your highlight of the year oh so many highlights throughout the year so many uh exciting games close games i think the one that sticks out probably the the uh tampa bay game <laughs> sticks out the most is just you know, to see us be able to come back and see the plays that we were able to make in that game to win that game, that's one that that really sticks out to me. It's, it's a lot of a lot of moments. I can't can't give them all, but a lot of moments. I think none special than the the win at the end of the year versus Indianapolis when we we're able to clinch our spot into the playoffs. It's one that you know we'll always remember. Always a significant uh, moment for our team and where we were at the time. So a very special moment there. I should have said it before he said it, but I was going to say the Tampa game too, just because that was, that was after that Carolina loss too. And and you're wondering, all right, how are they going to respond to this? And they came out and responded pretty damn strong. I would say the Jaguars game, just in that after that Owen two start, and you were kind of buckling yourself in for what you thought might be a long ride. That was the first indication that, Oh, okay. Phew. Like I can exhale now. And this team, even though that was that was kind of a fluky game, it wasn't as much of a blowout as the scoreboard showed. But you did some really good stuff in it, and um, it was it was the the real feel that all right, something's changed here from before. Talk about how you know the players have changed, perhaps some of the staff have changed. How much did this season prepare you for those changes and make it the truth? How much did this season prepare you? for these changes that might be coming in the staff and players? Yeah, this season, there's a lot of changes that occurred throughout the year. You talk about players is up and down. A lot of, you know, guys are in and out of the lineup. So just get used to being in this position. Things are going to change, right? And being able to be flexible and understand that that happens. And, you know, under my leadership, whatever happens, it's, it's my responsibility is to find the right people. And for me, I always come back to the people. If you find the right people, uh, that can lead, that are willing to help with a servant uh, mindset, servant leadership mindset. Like we find the right people. That's all that matters. I love uh, servant leaderships, like the real buzzword these days. And it's funny because I, I you, you just never know whether somebody's actually going to follow that or not. Like to genuinely be a servant leader and to have that as your mindset that hey, I'm here to serve you. I do feel that D'Amico 100% just has that vibe about him, and it would be impossible to. 
it'd be impossible to fake his demeanor and his attitude on a day in day out basis if he didn't feel that way there's a lot of guys that'll like read a book about servant leadership in the off season and come in and uh, i've shifted everything i'm no longer a maniacal sociopathic uh, ego driven dude i'm a servant leader yeah all right I think it was something along the lines of how much does it help you knowing that you have a guy at quarterback? Uh, how does it help you maybe identify other needs or what have you? Right. Having, having CJ, you know, to lead our team, I think that's the important question for every team. All right. You're in this league. Everybody's looking for that quarterback. All right. And we know how important the position is, you know, how I mean, the resources go into finding right the right guy to lead, and you know, over half the league has them, half don't. So it's a uh, it's a special position. It takes a special person to play that position, and you know, we're happy to have CJ leading us. Hey, D'Amico, next question: Could you tell me which teams you feel don't have a good quarterback? I, I'll tell you one thing: it's not uh, it's not the Baltimore Ravens. They have a hell of a quarterback. I want to say one thing: I was uh, I was actually kind of surprised. It, the amount of Ravens fans that were coming at me after last week's live streams. And but like, I think, I, I think at least part of it is that there are a lot of Ravens fans who understandably are still like kind of have a raw nerve when it comes to people who are skeptical of Lamar Jackson as a quarterback. And that like, it's almost like they're lashing out at Bill Polian still more so than I think the vast majority of people now understand and recognize like, Oh, okay. This dude's the real deal. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know how you couldn't watch him. And think, okay, this guy's the real deal. This is a huge. I've, the the Chiefs' defense is a much bigger test than the Texans' defense. Um, but it's just that he's so much more diverse in his options right now. And I don't, I don't know that Lamar Jackson has even changed that much, or that he just now has an offensive coordinator and offensive weaponry in the receiving core, which isn't, mind you, still not like you know a bunch of all pros out there. But he's just got more options and a better offense. And obviously, a few more years of experience. That um, I don't know. Like I don't. Uh, I don't think that Ravens fans need to be quite so touchy. My goodness. So I think I think the question was about finding guys that you can develop. So not necessarily the guys that go in the top rounds, but some of the later guys, something along those lines. Help those guys like Khalil Davis come come to his full potential this season. So how and how do you help them come to their full potential, like Khalil Davis? We've seen a lot of young guys for our team this year play a significant amount of time, and you saw guys get better and grow throughout the year, and that's where. I love coaching. I love that aspect of coaching is where you develop players. All right. Don't tell me what a guy can't do. Tell me what he can do. And let's see how we can continue to improve him and help him get to where we need him to be to play meaningful football. And we've done that with a lot of our young guys. And I don't like Khalil, but young guys, you talk about uh, Stingley, uh, Christian Harris, a lot of young guys talk about Juice Scrubs being able to step in. All of our rookies, right, who contributed this year, who probably played the our rookies probably played the most snaps out of any rookies in the league this year and not just playing snaps, but they play significant snaps. And our rookies were the reason why we won a lot of football games, you know, Tank, CJ, Will, Juice, a lot of guys, I mean, Jared Patterson stepping in and playing meaningful time for us. So yeah, all of our guys contributed, Henry contributed, all of our rookies contributed. And that's, uh, I feel like you truly build a team. You build it with those young guys and come in and they continue to improve and get better and continue to add more guys to come along and do the exact same thing. I think, um, you know, you need to add Khalil Davis in San Francisco. Henry Toto is another guy that, I like, I, you, he gets drafted where he does because I think they look at him as a project. And he's not quite as fluid athletically as a lot of other guys that are going to be like a Fred Warner or a Christian Harris or somebody like that or those guys that uh, play for the Ravens. My goodness. Uh, there, there's not, he's not he's not Roquan Smith, all right? I sat next to uh, – yesterday on the plane, one of my three plane rides yesterday, I sat next to a Chicago guy who was just sick about how well Roquan Smith uh, has been playing for the – the Ravens, because that was like that's what that's what that was the catalyst for the Ravens looking more like a Ravens defense last year was when they signed Roquan Smith. Off ball linebackers criminally underrated 
in, in the NFL. You know, I think like I, I honestly I wasn't even thinking about rookies, but maybe like guys like Kurt Heinish, Tier Tart. I'm just looking through the back end of the roster. A young Kareem Jackson. This Kareem Jackson fellow, he got a few reps in. I like his moxie. He's uh, his, this young guy's got a chance. And you know, and, and uh, 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 what's his name? Dang it. Uh, uh, Patterson. Yeah, Patterson. Very promising. And I, I do think that Juice Scruggs is just flat out meant to be a center more so than a guard. And I hope that some of his struggles, and they were rookie struggles, which happens, that I, he's going to look a lot better when he's playing center full time. When you were hired, did you think a run like this was possible? And, or did you even think, think like that? Well, when I was hired and whatever I do, uh, I think everybody wants to. <laughs> look at themselves as being the best at what you do. And that's how I envision it. I envision us being the best at what we do, having the best possible season that we can have. If you're not thinking about it that way, I don't know why you're in whatever you do. If you're not trying to be the best at what you're doing, if you're not, if you don't have a positive outlook on whatever you're doing, thinking it's going to impact people in a positive light and help others. Right? That's the reason why we all do what we do. You know, I think, like, obviously these guys are going to be confident. I wonder if, as, as everybody shifts more towards worrying about the process and focusing on the process, which I think is the right way to go, you still have to find a way to be goal-oriented. So a lot of times the goals become more about the, the process. Like, okay, if you're going to try to focus on more on a week-by-week, day-by-day basis, your goal is to have a perfect practice or as close to perfect as possible. Your goal is to do certain things within a single game. But it doesn't always match up well necessarily with what the, the media wants to write about because they, they want to hear a guy that came in and guaranteed that they're going to win a Super Bowl by next year. And it's just stupid because you can't – like you've been in the NFL long enough. You know, it doesn't work that way. Ravens, like the Ravens know it doesn't work that way. You can be a six seed and go off and win the Super Bowl. And there's other years where you look like you should be the most dominant team on earth and it just doesn't work out. Yeah. How important is it to you to – I'm guessing he said improve the running game because, my God, 38 yards rushing. The running game will be uh, significant for us to improve upon. I think as you see as you go throughout this game, especially in the postseason, right, teams that win games, you got to be able to run the football, right, and sustain it. And we weren't able to accomplish that versus the Ravens, and it showed up. So we have – Definitely areas to improve, uh, many different areas, but one game is one of those areas. You know, yeah, it showed up versus the Colts in a bad way too, which I, th- I think they were sacrificing a little in run defense to try to take care of the RPO and some of the mid-level passing game. But like Shane Steichen ain't going anywhere. I, that was the other man. Shane, that was one of the lessons from this year, looking at Shane Steichen and what he got out of Gardner Minshew. I, I don't know if Shane Steichen's a good head coach, but I think he's a hell of an offensive coordinator, including – he was the offensive coordinator in, in Philadelphia last year. Remember, Jalen Hurts just fell apart this year. They were good at the beginning of the year, and then he fell apart. If if my Shane Steichen theory holds true, it's that there was kind of like the the residue of last year, but then when it came time to adjust to adjustments, the they just weren't able to do it this year. That's my little pet theory. Just don't sleep on uh, don't sleep on Shane Shane Steichen. As far as the run defense, this is how I feel about it right now. I think for one. The the linebacker play was really good at times, but too inconsistent throughout the year, especially when it came to run pass keys and some of that. And you're just hopefully going to develop the young guys more and perhaps bring other guys in to, to rectify that. Along the defensive line, I loved what Rankins and Collins did this year. And yet at the same time, those guys are they're not like genuine run stuffers. Those guys are guys that can penetrate, but they also, like for guys who are penetrators, they do a really good job of anchoring down. Um, But then, you know, you compare them to some of the way that a team like the Ravens plays, and it's just, it's a different level of run stuffing. So I sometimes it's a matter of just one guy. Remember the Colts back when they couldn't stop the run at all? They brought in one big defensive lineman, I can't think of his name right now, and uh, like one badass linebacker, and that was enough alongside of, you know, opposite of Peyton Manning, but it, it made a difference. So sometimes it's just that one guy. The trick is in these days, you don't want a guy that you can easily take off the that the offense can scheme off the field. So you know, you don't want a guy that's that's useless on third down. 
like uh, like Vita Vea can be who he is because he can also rush the passer. You don't want a guy who's Vita Vea size. You know, at least you don't want to spend like a first round pick on a guy who's Vita Vea size, but then can't rush the passer because all the offense has to say is like, oh, okay, well we're gonna we're just gonna stay in we're just gonna stay in eleven personnel all all game long. I think they said, what is the plan for Damian Pierce? Uh, we'll see where all of our guys and all the positions on our, our team will look at the roster, myself and Nick, and see uh, where we are and where we have to improve our roster. And I think that's our job, you know, is to continue to improve our roster as best as we can. So Damian Pierce was on the post game. I know some of you heard this or heard me talk about it. Damian Pierce was on the post game. Uh, the week after the Browns game, after he had that touchdown. And he was very open and honest about how hard it was for him to adjust to this system this year. You know, it's it's not just a matter of just calling outside zone and then running outside zone. They, they are, they're very meticulous about who's assigned to what and how you're supposed to read, you know, based on front and all of these other things. And they ask the running backs to just process a lot more than you might in a typical just simple man blocking system. So Damian was like totally, totally cool about it. I mean, he just had a positive attitude and talked about how much Slowick has been patient with him, it, but that this is something that he's going to have to learn in the offseason. He's going to have to figure it in the offseason. He's very frank about it. He just said, this isn't something I can fix this season. So it's it's – not like it's a elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. I think Damian said very frank and honest conversation with Bobby Slowick. I'm guessing D'Amico Ryan. So it'll be interesting. I mean, there, there's uh, you know, there's no, there's no hurry to do anything. They've got his rights, and uh, he'll be here if he proves in the off season that that he should be here. Um, uh, I think a question about just what's the evaluation process for how you decide to bring back? Well, our evaluation process when it comes to injuries, I think every injury is it's its own. Okay, so it must be a question about these injuries. Maybe how do you prevent it, whatever, or evaluate the whole situation. I'll go back to the – so I don't interrupt him again. The evaluation process – what is the evaluation process as far as trying to keep guys healthy? Evaluation process when it comes to injuries, I think every injury is it's its own case. I don't think there's a one overarching theme with injuries. Things happen and guys get hurt all across the league. So it's a matter of, for us, we evaluate everything that we do um, when it comes to you know just how we how we treat our players, how we practice, how we do everything. Everything is an evaluation process. But it's not just one particular thing. If everybody knew exactly what it was, it will get it fixed. But uh, things happen. Yeah, they, uh, like <laughs> I remember one year, Kevin Bastine. I'm going to have to have him fact check me on this if my memory is correct. But he was the original head athletic trainer for the Texans. And I remember one year we had a very low injury rate. Uh, or that he did maybe back when he was with Washington before us. And uh, they they wanted to give him the athletic training staff of the year, and he he refused it. This is the way I remember it. I don't know if this is accurate or not. But uh, they refused it on the grounds that, like, look, if I take credit for the dumb luck we had in avoiding injuries this year, that means I'm to blame when we have a really bad run of bad luck a couple of years from now. It's tough because there, there are things that you can do but there's just it's just impossible on a case by case basis to know whether it's it's working with these guys or that's a reason for those guys you just try to try to take care of guys nutrition and treat their injuries and do a bunch of prehab uh, preventative rehabilitation as much as you can it just sucks the biggest every every time i get somebody that comes to me when i was a player and tells me like hey no i'll i'll prevent you. you'll never get injured again i'm like okay can you do something to where if i'm standing here and somebody comes up with a sledgehammer and they whack me in the knee with it is your magical supplement or exercise going to prevent that injury of course not and that's what like that's what you have in the nfl at times you got freakishly athletic and big and strong and fast dudes running into each other and sometimes the angles in the math just doesn't work out stupid physiology damn these mortal bones what's your thoughts on donald lee contributed and his growth this year and 
What are your thoughts on how somebody contributed and uh, like whether they'll be able to keep him around? I'm going to guess it's either John Grenard or Dalton Schultz. Those are the most talked about potential free agents. We would like to feel that all of our free agents would love to be here and they enjoy playing here in Houston. Again, special play, special team, uh, special organization. So I think most of our guys would love to be back here. Uh, Jonathan specifically, he did a, a really great job for us. I think it's his most his productive year. Best year of his career, he did some really great things to allow us to be in position to win some games. Right, you, everything I believe in, it starts up front with the with the rush, all right, and also with the offensive line and protecting. So, you know, we'll continue to build with our fronts, start at the front and build backwards. That's how I envision it. And uh, Jonathan had a really great year. Okay, so Jonathan had a great year. I don't know if they'll be able to keep him or not. I think the the one example that's been brought up before is Trey Hendrickson, the defensive end for the Saints. He kind of had a similar trajectory where he was a good player in his first couple of years, but then his free agency year, he really took off. He had like 12 or 13 sacks, got a nice contract with the Bengals. It's been a very good signing for them, but it wasn't it wasn't a record breaking contract or anything. It was, you know, less than what I want to say, like less than 50 million guaranteed. And I think that's what Grenard might get. I'd be a okay with that. Um, I just wonder though, too, there's other guys out there. It depends on how premier the Texans want to go with signing a, a name free agent on defense. You know, Chris Jones, I think I uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, or maybe it's the speculation is that, when he came back this year, there maybe was an agreement that he wouldn't get franchise tagged by the Chiefs. Obviously, an interior guy. They tried to make him an edge guy, but an interior guy. But in terms of defensive linemen, um, several good edge rushers out there. Patrick Queen for off-ball linebackers and, and Matabike. So if you take, if you want to take one of those guys, they're not going to be able to franchise tag both those guys amongst whichever other free agents are in uh, out there with the Ravens. And those, like both those guys would be very, very intriguing. Uh, and we can do a whole free agency special at some point, which reminds me too, real quick. I've had a few people say, hey, where was this version of Jadeveon Clowney when he was with the Texans? He had a three-year stretch where he was that exact version. He's actually better than he was with the Ravens this year. Like, it's just that he wasn't a number one overall pick with the Ravens. So the expectations aren't, oh, he's going to get 18 sacks a year, just like JJ, right? They can just take him and without any of the extra pressure or baggage that comes with it, he's just, he's playing not even up to the caliber he was that three year stretch in Houston. And, and I think people just don't realize he was really, really good as a, as a penetrating run stuffer, also as a guy that, Got a lot of heat on the quarterback. He just didn't quite have the bend to get the quarterbacks down, but doing a lot of the same stuff he did. I'd be I'd be surprised if the Texans bring Clowney in. Um, and, and I kind of like the magical mystery tour he's on of just going and playing for a team here for a year, a team there for a couple of years. Might get a Super Bowl ring out of it this year. I, he's my favorite to get a Super Bowl ring out of it this year in terms of the Ravens. Freaking machine. Um, evaluate CJ's season as a whole from start to finish. How would you evaluate CJ's season as a whole from start to finish? Yeah, CJ's throughout the entire year. Uh, what I love most about it is the growth. Right? You talk about from where we started and our first game of the season and how he grew right? as a player, as a leader with our team. Like It's encouraging when you have a young guy who's able to grow not only as the entire season, but to see him grow and take the coaching points and grow from week to week and see a guy improve so quickly, like it's uh, it's encouraging to see how much better he can get as he continues to uh, play throughout the league. But it's uh, that's one thing I'm, I'm all about is growth. And the more we grow and the better we the better we become, right, the better our chances are of winning a ton of football games. So CJ, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, I would say initially – he was a little bit happy footed at times, wasn't setting his feet. He fixed that super quick. He was taking a lot of sacks early on, 12 sacks in the first two games. He, he figured out by game three, he had to get rid of the ball quickly and did that to a ridiculous stretch where he went four or five games without, uh, or several games without getting sacked. I get the no interceptions and the no sack streaks combined. He did both those things really well, including right from the get-go, not throwing inter any interceptions. That that remains one of the most impressive things I've ever seen out of a rookie is a guy that averages eight yards per throw, uh, but then also just eight yards per uh, completion, but also doesn't throw interceptions. Has a one has leads the league in interception rate. Um, 
but also leads the league in yards per game is just is crazy. So the the level of maturity and his ability to kind of absorb lessons and go with them, it, it was really impressive. And again, that's that's why I think a lot of people might not realize just how impressive that Ravens defensive performance was. Not in that they shut the Texans down, but in that they made they forced CJ to look a lot more like a rookie because the defense the offensive line was so thoroughly just bamboozled, confounded, confused, whatever whatever word for being completely lost is, uh, that's that's what the Texans offensive line was. The blitz packages, the disguise of all of it, it was really, really damn impressive. So um it, like that's it's more so than the yardage or anything else like that. I, I like I watched that Ravens defense after they'd played the Browns the week before. The Texans played the Browns the week before, and they just didn't have any answers. I mean, just completely. And yeah, th- it's just uh, it's pretty damn impressive. Damn impressive by the Ravens defense. And I say all that just to say, yeah, CJ came a long, long way. <laughs> Okay, so how do you manage your staff when you have guys who may be leaving? You know, do you have contingencies? It it is super interesting because there's a timing element here. You know, you don't know if you're gonna lose a guy or not, so you can't be out hiring a guy. But maybe I don't know, maybe you have a little conversation. I don't know. I don't know. Everybody's different. Well, first off, it's a credit to our, our staff and it's the success that we had throughout the year. And a lot of people are trying to see uh, what's going on in Houston. And a lot of people want to get, you know, have interview requests on boards. It's a credit when it's kind of the nature of success. When you have success, other people want to see what's going on and they probably want to take some guys, you know, to help them out as well. So it's a, uh, it's a tough part of it, but it's part of the business. It's part, that's what happens. And we'll have to have contingency plans available if, if guys, you know, happen to leave. So one thing I would say is it's it's interesting. It's illustrative, I guess. You know, as much as you get frustrated sometimes with assistant coaches or offensive line coaches, especially, why aren't they figuring this out? Uh, the head coach just matters a lot because, you know, the offensive line coaches for the Ravens, Mike Devlin former Texans offensive line coach, much maligned Mike Devlin. Uh, you know, the tight ends coaches, George Godsey. So not the offensive coordinator, but still a viable coach on an awesome NFL team. So there's, I, I think sometimes there's overemphasis at times on the coordinators. It's, it's not an overemphasis when you're talking about an offensive coordinator with a young guy. And if Bobby were to leave as Gerard Johnson is now also getting interviews. A lot of names start flying out of nowhere. Clint Kubiak's been mentioned a lot. I'll just say right now, I'll do a separate episode on potential replacements for a potential Bobby Sloak departure. It's I would be floored, floored if it's somebody from outside the Kubiak Shanahan tree. It's just like this is what CJ knows, the terminology, the philosophy, all of that stuff. They can get somebody in that thinks about football very, very similarly to Bobby Slowick. So I just, I don't think, and I don't think D'Amico, it's not like D'Amico would want, and I don't think Casario would want it either to bring in like a, a McDaniels or McDaniels, Josh McDaniels acolyte or something like that. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. I'd be super nervous. I'll tell you right now, that was, that's what happens. Hold me to this. I'll freak the hell out. Freak out. Yeah, you can't talk about CJ's success without talking about Gerard and, and what he. I thought he said Ger- Gerard, uh, like like David Gerard, the quarterback. Is he on staff now too? So Gerard Johnson, the quarterbacks coach. He was able to do the relationship that he had with him, uh, just being there for him as a position coach, teaching him, guiding him along the way. Right, Gerard is one of the reasons why CJ had a successful year. Oh, the other thing too, I'd say is just building a pipeline. Building a pipeline is a big deal. Just build a pipeline, build it, and they will develop. But getting CJ just two years, two years of consistency with Bobby Sloak, I'd be cool. I don't care if you think Bobby Sloak's the worst play caller in the world or whatever. I think he was severely limited by his personnel. The one thing I really worry about with Bobby Sloak is the run game. And just as a passing game coordinator and the way the, the run game struggled this year, yes, there are excuses, but man, man. 38 yards rushing. Um, a lot of you, know, as far as the team, they always talk about how you and your team are more so like a coach in the locker room. 
How much did that time actually, you know, lay the groundwork for your coaching career, especially considering that you was able to um, get that development teaching aspect from like a player? player? I think the question was about how uh, how it helped him being a player. Like how how did him being a player help him as a coach and teaching players? The thing about me is when you come to developing people, players, I always, even as a player, like I always felt it was right for me to help other guys who played alongside me. Like that's how it was when I first stepped onto this, to the field here for the Houston Texans in 2006. Right? A lot of older guys took me under their wing and they showed me the ropes. And so that's how I knew the NFL to be, right? The, the older guys, right? you reach back and you help the younger guys. You pour in as much information into those guys as possible, even though you know guys are going to take your job and they're going to move you out. There was never a selfish moment from my interacting with veteran players when I first came into the league. And that's just, that was how I saw it. And that's how I operated throughout my entire career while I was playing. And that's why I got back in the got into coaching it's because I wanted to reach back and help players. So it's truly, that's my heart. That's why I do it. It's about serving the players, helping them to further their careers, be the best that they can possibly be within their careers. That's what drives me each and every day. So you talk about developing young players. That's where my drive is. That's where my passion is. But I've been this way since I was playing back in uh, 2006 because I got that example from a ton of veteran guys who showed me the way. Um, and you know, the, the really cool thing is that that, that is part of being an older player in the NFL, other than the quarterback position where it's all screwy. You remember Roethlisberger got a bunch of crap for saying it wasn't his job to develop Kenny Pickett. Remember uh, like, it's true for quarterbacks. That's true for quarterbacks for other players. You're like part of your value as you get older is to be a guy that helps the younger guys. And with that understanding, you know, you are training your replacement on the defensive line. It's a little bit easier because there's a rotation. So it's easy to be, <laughs> you're trying to get to that spot where you only come in as a situational player. That's the, that's the, that's the sweet spot when those last few years, like I wasn't a pass rusher, so it wasn't going to happen for me, but for pass rushers, that those last few years where you just come in on on second and long and third and long and rush the passer that is some smooth retirement living right there and but for other positions too yeah you know you're hiring a guy you're training a guy that's going to eventually replace you but that's part of your value there is something about the opportunity to be a head coach i don't know is pride in it and you know there is pride in it and you know you don't get this opportunity much right for to be able to come back and you know lead organizations that i play for it's special to me it means more to me than just wins and law it's it's about establishing pride into our organization into our team establishing the excitement for our team around the city and i think we've did that this year I think a lot of people were excited to watch the Texans play football, and we made a lot of people proud and to support our team, and, and that's what it's all about to me, instilling hope into our city, and that's what we did. Yeah, it, was, it, was just, it was just way different. That watch party at Discovery Green this weekend, that was just really cool, and it was just a different uh, – there's a different level of excitement, I, and I talked to a lot of fans that are diehard fans – who were pretty realistic about the chances <laughs> versus the Ravens. You know, they were asking me like, hey, look, hey, seriously, do we have a chance? And I said, yeah, they have a chance. Um, you know, and that's what, like, that's like, yeah, I was talking smack last week because I felt like I wanted to. If they had a chance. It just obviously didn't work out. If D'Amico, if D'Amico's strategy of blitzing the hell out of the Ravens had been complemented by an offense, an offense that was able to drive the ball and, keep the Ravens from getting a bead on those those blitzes as much. It could have worked out really what they needed, though. They needed to come up with some turnovers. Like those blitzes, especially when they were still really working, that's when, man, if Jalen Petrie could have come up with the ball. There's one other errant throw by Lamar, but other than that, he really didn't give many opportunities at all for the Texans to do it. So that's where that's where that strategy came up short. And I think D'Amico knew that it was, it was going to be boomer bust. That either works when you blitz that much, when you blitz 75% of the time, it's either going to work or you're going to get destroyed. <laughs> and I got destroyed. This year, take a little bit of a break. Last year, you stepped right in as a team in downtime. What's, what's kind of like your schedule 
able to hear this back. And so we have to think back full time. Uh, the question was something about what's your schedule going to be? Um, like, what's your schedule for downtime before you really get back into it? It's been full speed ahead <laughs> from first getting hired to now this point here. It's been full speed ahead. So we'll take a little time off to rest. Everybody needs a little rest. <laughs> so we'll take some time off to rest before we get back rolling with free agency and draft. But definitely need much needed rest is, is ahead of us for sure. That that's one benefit I think too of having a, a definitive GM and head coach. Or Nick is going to be way more the personnel guy than D'Amico. Nick needs D'Amico's input, but this is where this is where Nick can really hit the hit the long long hours as they start going out on the. I almost said the recruiting trail. It feels like that. Franchise like no one really knew the direction. They didn't know what they were getting in you. They didn't know what they were getting in the quarterback. So the conversation with free agents, you didn't really know what to sell them. Now you know what to sell. How different are those conversations going to be? Okay, so good good question. It's which is last year this time when they were going out to start to talk to free agents or when free agency began, they didn't have a quarterback. They didn't have any track record of any kind of success. And the Texans had a, the question wasn't phrased this way, but I'm thinking the there was a lot of bad PR on the Texans. So how does the challenge in recruiting free agents change? And again, yeah, they're not on the recruiting trail. Like, obviously, you're just, it's a quick pitch, and sometimes it's who's got the most money. Um, but what, what is the pitch to free agents now compared to before? Uh, the conversation with our guys, it's for any free agent, it's about opportunities, right? I mean, guys want opportunities to showcase their talent when you're a free agent. And I think now with people seeing how we play, seeing our young core players, right, especially seeing CJ, I think, a lot of people probably want to play here in Houston, right? And, you know, that comes from the success that these guys have had, how they've shown up on the field. I think you get that recognition and you get that credibility from your peers around the league, and that's what matters most. Our guys watch tape. They see how we play. They see how we operate. And I think that will be inviting to a lot of free agents to come here. But, again, for me, it would always be about the people. And getting the right people in is, is everything to me. Okay, so two guys I would mention. Go back to Tyron Matthew. Uh, Tyron Matthew, Tyron, Tyron Matthew came here partly because that Romeo Cornell defense was was good. You know, I think people forget sometimes that it was a good defense. And he saw it as an opportunity to springboard into another contract, either with the Texans or somebody else. And, and it did. It worked out great for Tyron Matthew. I think Dalton Schultz last year was a guy that – wouldn't have known that he could come here and springboard into something else, but because there there was no CJ Stroud at the time, you know, it was, uh, it was way before the draft. Um, I think there'll be more of those guys, the marquee guys that get the big contracts for the most part, the money's going to determine where those guys go. I'm much more intrigued by the guys who maybe are mid tier and really do want that prove it deal. Or maybe they thought they were going to get a five year deal somewhere or something, but Hey, Two years with the Texans and a chance to play with C.J. Stroud makes a big difference. That's that's the the real benefit there is not the top tier guys, but the second and third level, which a lot of times end up being your best free agent pickups anyway. Certainly from a from a uh, you know bang for your buck perspective. No. Oh. It starts with with CJ, just him himself have the mindset that he has to continue to grow, continue to get better. That's everything, right? And we'll continue to support him, surround him with the right people to help him get his get reach his potential, get as better as he can get better each and every day. We'll continue to help CJ along. But it helps most when a player has that drive, he has that inner will, that spirit to continue to get better. That that's the only thing that matters. When you have the right mindset, no matter what happens, he'll continue to get better. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think just... So the question started off, you talked about growth earlier, so I'm, I'm guessing you asked the question about D'Amico's growth. Throughout the entire year, I've grown just with, I think, communication just amongst staff, communication amongst the entire building, making sure everybody is aligned in what we're, what we're doing, our vision. Uh, and that, that was the biggest thing for me. It's, it's different, of course, when you just focused on one position or one side of the ball, but just being able to 
make sure everybody in the entire organization is on the same page. It took growth to get there, and I think ended up in a really good spot this year. Okay. The one time that I really questioned whether D'Amico should be the defensive coordinator or at least the defensive play caller was that that lack of a challenge on the Devin Singletary play. What the hell? What the hell? Maybe I haven't gone back and watched closely enough yet because we sure as hell didn't get a replay from the, the TV crew. But that Devin Singletary on second down where it looked like he rolled at least very close to the first down marker and they didn't challenge it. And they didn't just not challenge it. They came up and went up tempo to get another playoff. Like they were the ones that should have been afraid of the challenge or something. And I think sometimes when that happens, it's because they had that plan to come up, you know, you call two plays in the huddle and just get up and go. Um, but like that's, that's the one time other than that, I thought it was, it was all pretty smooth. That right there was maybe one of the one game manage the questionable game management things uh, of just very few that we saw from D'Amico this year. I think D'Amico as defensive coordinator, he talks about the communication. Remember for a while, it looked like Matt Burke was going to call plays and it was kind of, they, they were very open about saying they'd figured out as it went along. And then it became pretty definitive that it was going to be D'Amico. I, I never sensed that there was like disapproval by D'Amico to Matt Burke or anything, but I think he probably, I'm guessing he really hopes that Matt Burke can be the play caller at some point. He just wanted to be sure kind of like, you know, when you're training your replacement, you want to be sure that they're that they're ready before they jump into into the flames. But for the most part, if D'Amico wanted to keep being the defensive coordinator, I'm cool with it for now. Like I don't see it being an issue. We'll close with Sarge and John. Um, Coach, I know that you uh, played a football so much, but how exciting is it for you from a husband, from a father perspective, to be able to take a step away from the game for just a little bit before you have to start, you know, getting ready for the combine and things. Like so, so he said, "How basically, how excited are you to be able to take a step away from the game to spend time with your family for a little bit? So he can be there for his kids and his wife. Uh, family is the most important thing. So for me to get an opportunity to get a break, I don't know if I get a break. My wife is, my wife is we expect this. My wife is due here in a couple of weeks. So <laughs> I'm on baby watch. So my <laughs> man." The stress level doesn't stop for me. <laughs> Here we are again. All right? I know you're doing it too. February, March, April. <laughs> D'Amico was it? D'Amico. Never, never mind. He was, you know, he's that, yeah. Season. But uh, now, very thankful for my family always and their support and seeing them every game, seeing their support, win or lose. Yeah. I'm just saying. They drafted C.J. Stroud. They went aggressively for Will Anderson. Like, D'Amico was in full-grown man mode all uh, all last spring. No smiles on my kid's face, on my wife's face. It's uh, it's always uplifting to me. So I'm I'm excited to be able to spend some time with them, go hang out in the car line with everyone else. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, definitely be a fun time. Thank you for the question. It's got to be. <laughs> I would hate to be D'Amico. D'Amico in the car line might. I bet the the person in charge of unloading the kids hates that because I bet to me going the car line causes things to a, a little bit of a hiccup. There's just going to be at least one or two people that like stop and like want to run over and talk to him and uh, just and he's so polite, hmm? but at the same time servant leader. So he'll he'll help them out and say, hey, hey, we got to get moving along. No, we don't know. We're waiting until the actual day. <laughs> They don't know. Uh, they don't know boy or girl yet. When you talk about the defense, you've always talked about starts up front. You've got two of your starters contracts up. When you were with the 49ers, y'all invested so heavily in the defensive line. How important is it to you to continue to improve up front? Since you said that sets the tone for everything. The front. I think the question was about investing. I think in the defensive line, the defensive front. Again, is everything for me, and we'll have. The front, again, is everything for me, and we'll have invest a ton of resources into the front. If you want to play good defense, right, your front has to be elite. And that's why I envision us playing elite defensive football. We, we have to get better there, and to get better, you have to invest the resources there up front. So that's what we'll do. That's where we're, our focus is heading into the offseason is to make sure our front right, gives us an opportunity to win some games. I think that's something that's important, too, is that 
you invest resources in the defensive line, it doesn't just mean a Will Anderson or some of the more marquee guys. Like They want to be able to play eight defensive linemen and rotate guys through. So um, invest, 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 not just in free agents or first round picks, but also the mid rounds and later on. And then the development of those guys, Jacques Cesare, the defensive line coach, just getting the absolute most out of those guys. I think there's a lot more room for still an increased overall, I both athleticism and ass kicking quotient on the defensive line is fine with the starters. I um, just like to have, you'd like to have, you know, the, the 49ers, I think Amenihu wasn't a starter the first year he was there, but Amenihu is a guy that was like rotating in, um, like kind of that caliber guy and and more. And they got the best out of Amenihu in San Francisco. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the questions here. The... Da, 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 da. All right. Let's start the most recent ones, some of the ones I grabbed. <clears throat> um, I don't think we need a running back. We need to incorporate the screen more. I, I think that, um, like, uh, it's it's so dicey paying a running back a second contract, and it's it's usually not a good idea uh, unless you can get it at a bargain. But, like, to give a guy a marquee <clears throat> contract, uh, we'll see. Like, I, I don't know if Christian McCaffrey, the equivalent of him, Christian McCaffrey, is going to be out there. I thought that I thought that they tried to incorporate screens with middling success. At times they did. At, at times they just abandoned it. Um, but uh, 100%, yeah. Like, if you look at the 49ers, now the 49ers, with or without Christian McCaffrey, they do a brilliant job running screens because the offensive linemen – uh set it up perfectly and they just uh they boy they it's it's like clockwork watching them the rate uh the the chiefs also chiefs very very good at setting screens uh servant leadership is not a new thing it's been around for a couple of decades at least and yes it's hard to live by the principles but yeah 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 li listen twist for robin i'm not i'm not trying to say that like uh somebody recently invented it these things go in waves though in the nfl so like there's there's lots of stuff out there that has been around for decades, but for whatever reason, like some one team latches on to one of these philosophies, whether it's seven habits or something like that, and then it gets really annoying for a while because all of a sudden everybody is is citing it for a while. So when I said that's what people are talking about these days, I was talking about the NFL. It wasn't it wasn't a talking point as much like a decade ago as it is now. Uh, how long do we get Bobby to make his decision? And are we interviewing for OC? Uh, it's a good question. None of these things are set in stone, you know, and there's times there's kind of like a gentleman's agreement, I suppose that you're not going to go and try to poach somebody after a certain amount of time. Um, so it's usually within a few weeks and it really once really what it is, is once all the head coach spots are filled, like you have to, okay, if what you're asking is, are they going to say all of a sudden, like, no, Bobby, you can't go on any more interviews. They'll never do that. Because then you get the reputation of a team that's not going to have, like, young, talented coaches aren't going to want to go coach for the Texans if you're banning them. Now, there have been some exceptions in the past. You know, like, if something if something weird happened in, like, March or something, then the team would say, no, you're not, no, you're not going to go interview for a job right now. Uh, so I would say... Usually by a little bit after the Super Bowl, all of the head coaching positions are filled. What was the other ones? Let's see. Not all vets pour into younger players, though. I don't get why it's a team mentality. Yeah, I like it, it's it's the kind of guys you have on your team. You know, some guys they've got some teams have a lot of jerks, and uh, those guys don't necessarily pour into them the way some guys do. If you could fix one position on this team, what would it be? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I saw a couple of people answered running back to this. If I could fix one position, I don't want to say offensive line because they've put a lot. Okay, you know what? I'll say tight end. So right now, Dalton Schultz is not on the team. Um, Brevin Jordan is on the team. But I don't think Brevin Jordan is the guy uh, to be a complete total tight end i think he's like he's as much a, a slot receiver slash tight end and i i love the way he plays i think he gives good effort and everything he's just not a bigger guy if dalton schultz comes back i think you're working with something with those two and bringing another a rookie to develop um but if dalton schultz leaves i don't think it's as simple as just 
rolling with Brevin Jordan. They're either going to have to draft a tight end high or go out and find one in, in free agency. Um, I'll put more thought into that. It's I got to create a, a power ranking of wish list by position because there are other weaknesses there. Uh, like, frankly, linebacker. As much as I love Christian Harris, I'm uh, you're running a four three, and I don't feel great really about anybody except Christian Harris and his trajectory, and he's not a complete product yet. So, like, that's that's the spot that if you want this defense to be genuinely awesome. I look at San Francisco and the way that D'Amico was with both Fred Warner and uh, Dre Greenlaw and how much those two guys have meant for that team. I'd love for them to get to that spot. <clears throat> this is an interesting one. Grenard or Chase Young? I'm wondering if Chase Young, I'm going to share something here. I wonder if Chase Young ends up commanding something that this sometimes happens. Guys who have underproduced but are former high draft picks and have extreme physical skills. Yeah, they like they get sometimes more money than you'd expect. But this is Jonathan Grenard. Let me be sure that you guys are seeing this. All right. Jonathan Grenard versus Chase Young. Like Chase Young, prototype size, speed, athleticism, all that. And John Grenard's a smaller guy. They both had injury issues. But Grenard's played 48 games to Chase Young's 43. Uh, Grenard has, let's see, 23 sacks to Chase Young, 16 and a half. Grenard has 78 solo tackles to Chase Young, 67. Grenard has one interception. Um, forced fumbles. Wow, Chase Young's got six forced fumbles. But the, like Chase Young's missed a lot of time in his career. And uh, he is, boy, Grenard's six, 26 years old. Um, Chase Young is 24 years old. It's it's interesting. I want to look at TFLs if they stacked them up here. Jonathan Grenard has 32 TFLs to 32 TFLs. Where'd it go? To Chase Young's 20 TFLs. 120 combined tackles to 100 combined tackles. Um 23 sacks to 16 and a half sacks. Like he's not bad at all. Let's see. Where'd it go? There we go. So, I, and I think that, like, Grenard, I think will end up being a better deal. Um, I would say, off of the, like, my gut would tell me Grenard, honestly. Chase Young's missed, a, like, almost two, he's missed huge chunks of two seasons. And, and, and this is a big one, Grenard is known to be a really solid dude. And, like, you know what you have in Grenard. I hesitate sometimes, like, uh, I know like some people have questions about Chase Young and just uh, I don't know whether it's attitude or what have you. Like, I, I don't know. That's dicey when people start floating stuff out there, especially when you're in an organization that's been pretty dysfunctional. Because I would say the same thing about Justin Reed, perhaps. Like, whatever happened with Justin Reed and David Culley, I don't judge him harshly for that one bit. I don't judge any of the guys that maybe left under weird circumstances because the Texans were a dysfunctional organization. So when... When healthy people are thrust into dysfunctional organizations, they they don't act. They're not happy about it, you know? And sometimes they get cast as the villain when, in fact, it's uh, something else. So I have no idea other than that I know for sure that Grenard's an awesome dude. It's just um, he's not prototype the way Chase Young is. That's going to be the objection. Uh, oh, oh, I know I saw this was uh, Casario can find a market for him. That was a comment about Damian Pierce. Yeah, they got to make a decision – you know, Damian himself has said it's been a really hard adjustment learning this system. And, uh, you know, he might maybe be better off ultimately going to a place that just, ma you know, majors in man blocking schemes more so, which is what Damian's really good at. I don't, Damian's not, like, I don't think he's ever going to agitate for a trade. I think he looks at it as a challenge that he wants to accept and and learn this this offense. You know, I think he really likes it around here. A lot of these guys really like it around here. It's really cool to see after some of the issues. Uh, I want to get this Stroud press conference going. So bear with me for a second because I got to share the screen. So CJ Stroud coming up. Chrome tab.
Let me get you out of there. Sorry, uh, Italo. Italo? That's a cool name. Italo? Somebody correct my pronunciation there. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. We're going to have CJ Stroud, uh, CJ Stroud, quarterback for your Houston Texans. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, man, it's huge, man. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear that. Um, uh, Honestly, like I'm excited to get back to work, but of course uh, it takes time. Like can't just rush into it. But uh, I'm really excited to see how much this team's gonna grow. Um, and like D'Amico said, man, we gotta find some way to get back to that moment and and win that game. You know, so um, a lot of experience was was made this year and things like that. So I'm super. All right, everybody. Sorry, let me set this up better. I gotta get a producer. I got to get a producer. The problem is they'd have to be available like um, 19 hours a day for my erratic schedule. I can't handle that kind of maturity yet. All right, here we go. Um, CJ talking about how upset he was. Let me start this over. Sorry, everybody. Honestly, like, I'm excited to get back to work, but of course uh, it takes time. I like, can't just rush into it, but uh, I'm really excited to see how much this team is going to grow. Um, and like D'Amico said, man, we got to find some way to get back to that moment and, and win that game, you know. So um, a lot of experience was, was made this year and things like that. So I'm super, super excited for the future and everything like that. Yeah, I mean. Oh, OK. So uh, Will Anderson who talked about how he was basically crying after the game and uh and cj came up to him and said hey we're good what are you crying about and uh so a kudos to will anderson for admitting that he was crying real men strong men can cry as the big big lebowski said in the big lebowski strong men do cry and uh, cj said like what we're gonna be we're gonna be fine uh, i appreciated will for doing that you know because i mean that, that those are raw emotions it wasn't like he was doing that like just to be fake he, he really meant uh, cause I mean, he really like was feeling that cause he really wanted to win that game. We all did. Um, and something I've learned in this league, man, is like, um, you can't let, let your emotions fluctuate. And, uh, I told Will, man, you're the, honestly, man, he's probably the most talented player. One of the t most talented players I've ever been around in my life. I said, man, we're going to be back in this moment. You can promise you, like, you, I can promise you that. Like, it might not, I don't know when it's going to be, how it's going to be, who's going to be on this team, but we're going to get back. And, um, I just want to let him know, man, like, um, I appreciated everything that he did for us that year. I just wanted to see his head up high, you know. I just want to see him encouraged and, and positive. That was a, like those two guys are guys that have, you know, well, Will's won a national championship and then been lost in the playoffs. And uh, like when the expectation is a championship, that's a pretty cool standard to have. And, uh, and, and CJ, too, obviously. I think there is something about that where CJ – like CJ has super high standards and expectations, but I think he's also, I think through his experiences at Ohio state, he's been through some of the experiences, but like the guy like Lamar Jackson, I, I think like Lamar Jackson has had, he's seen both sides of it. He's seen boy being treated like, wow, the fresh young thing, but then also treated like, Oh wow. Now this guy's, uh, this guy's never going to make it. And and he's seen that in the NFL, but I don't know if he necessarily had that same scrutiny or a level of pressure at Louisville. Now, CJ at Ohio State saw all of the ugly sides of it. He saw all the great sides of it. And I think he's just learned to handle it in stride and like in a way that uh, I don't – And some people were worried about like, okay, well, hey, CJ comes from a school where they win, win, win. How's he going to handle losses? And he talked about that, that it is like kind of jarring to, to lose because he hasn't lost that much. But he's seen that pressure and he's seen the – He's known which parts of it to ignore, which is cool. Uh, I don't know what the question was. Let me let me see if I yeah, let's see, I'll just hear. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily name myself as a guy with a chip on his shoulder. I just think I'm me, you know. Like I don't really try to. Uh, I, I used to be in the business of um, proving people wrong and people pleasing and stuff. Man, that stuff is exhausting and it don't make no sense. So, um, honestly, man, I'm really going to be just preparing for what, what we got going on here. Uh, yeah, we lost to Baltimore up there and 
Um, there's some things that we need to get fixed, of course, but it's time for that um, uh, once we get back to those moments, you know. And, and right now it's all about getting better um, and, and just really putting our best foot forward on making yourself better as, as a person, as a player, you know, and um, that's something I, that I uh, definitely am excited to get into. Okay, that was like that was really cool because I, I think I I did a I think I did a video about him having a chip on his shoulder like in a good way the way that you know Tom Brady and a lot of those guys had chips on their shoulders because because CJ wasn't uh, one of the top recruits coming out of high school he really had to earn it at Ohio State and I like, I think you've been able to see this transition you watch him from college through now um, like I just I, I don't want to just keep beating the same dead horse. Um, about his experience at Ohio State, but then running through the ringer of the draft and the S2 cognition test and all of that stuff. I think you just learned, like like you said, you just burn too much energy at it. You know, you just, you got to, at some point, you just got to freaking relax and play football. Um, for first, I'm just, I'm going to relax, man. Just, you know, just take some time off. Um, I mean, I really been, I've been going hard since I've been like 12 years old, you know, like, AAU tournaments, baseball, football, seven on seven, high school, you know, like just a lot, a ton of like just sports being played, you know, and, and man, it's been a blessing, been a ball. And it's like, I'm 22, 22 years old. And this is my first time ever having like freedom, you know, like from away from school, away from college. Um, and so I'm excited, but at the same time, like, uh, just like I'm ready to like to relax. I'm ready to get back to work too. But I know like I have to like, take some time to myself, you know, it's just the right thing to do. So, um, doing that for a little bit, um, getting back rolling, um, with my workouts, strength and conditioning, getting stronger, bigger, faster, um, getting back with my guys in LA, just working out with them on the quarterback stuff and, um, and OTAs and stuff like that. It is cool. Um, like kids these days are just, I think they're, they're way more, training facilities away from the facility that specialize in working with professional athletes i think than there used to be and the guys like guys just spend more time in those places uh like as a matter of routine in the off season so i don't worry about that at all what he said though about kind of just being away from structure for the first time sometimes that can be a bad thing for a young quarterback uh, i don't i don't worry about that for cj whatsoever i think he's gonna do just fine with uh, the lack of structure i don't want to see him standing on a camel uh over in uh, on, a, on a vacation to, to the way some other quarterbacks have because i think that was the same year that all yeah bringing back bad memories Okay, so uh, he's asked about, I believe, Bobby Sloak and Gerard Johnson. Is there any trepidation about either or both of those guys not being back here next year? Gerard, um, I've known Gerard since I was 16. Um, I was uh, in the Elite 11 uh, with him. He was my quarterback coach there. And one thing, man, I can say about Gerard, man, is like when you talk about someone who knows how to play the uh, position of quarterback and knows how to relay something, um, but also just a great person, man, a, a guy who, who uh, loves – uh, football. He loves Houston. He loves Texas. Um, he loves his family. He's a great family man. Um, and somebody who's taught me just a, a tremendous, a, a, a tremendous amount of information. But on top of that, man, put a lot of confidence into me as well. Like when I was 16 at Elite 11, we did like this little like circle group. It was like all the quarterbacks in my group. And Gerard's one thing for me was like be confident because he at that time like I wasn't really the highest recruit. I wasn't uh, who I who I will become. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I always knew that it would be a possibility, but I didn't. I didn't hear it out like those type of the drives I looked up to. Like he played at Texas A&M, I knew that um, and stuff like that. And when he was like, "Man, you need to be more confident," like, and it was just like it changed my life. You know what I'm saying? And from there, like fast forward, I'm here with him my rookie year. Um, it's been just a, a blessing to work with him. And I'm whatever happens, man, I'm excited for him, and he deserves everything that's coming for him. And um, I'm super blessed to be able to work with him and Bobby, um, somebody who when I came in, man, I knew that. Um, he was going to uh, push me hard. He was going to be hard on me. He was, he held me at a standard all year, held me accountable. Cause I mean, a lot of times, man, when you're playing good ball, um, guys, they, they kind of like let you do what you do and like leave you alone. Um, but Bobby, man, he was always on me about like the little details, um, in my position, you know what I'm saying? And I appreciated that, you know, cause you don't always get that. And he always just was hard on me. Uh, but also showed me a lot of love, man. A ton of love, very knowledgeable, um, can really dice dice the defense up, uh, puts a lot of trust in his players, 
um, and really just never got away from what he what he knows. You know what I'm saying? Of course, like um, tailored his his coaching to like what was here at the Texans, but he did what was at the core of his heart, and I could appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? And, um, but whatever happens with those guys, uh, they deserve whatever whatever um, uh, what is, whatever's coming to them. And I've been uh, it's been a blessing working with them. But if they come back, that'd be cool too. <laughs> Uh, you know, I just saw one thing real quick uh, before we do. Are you, if you're, are you referring to, uh, are you referring to CJ's answer? Because I didn't think, like, I, I, I guess the, yeah, I guess he didn't answer the question. You know, what will you do if they don't? Uh, I guess the thoughts were just like about potentially losing them. He answered that at the very end. Um, as far as Jarrod Johnson goes, that's a really cool story about Jarrod just telling him that he needs confidence because he. I think you tell that to a lot of kids and uh, what are they going to do with it? I don't know. Um, it's, it's hard to just all of a sudden have confidence, but then there is the whole, uh, like, okay, if that's what I need to do and I need to have confidence or at least fake it until I make it and project confidence until I become genuinely confident. Like he said, that was life changing for him. That's really cool. Draw Johnson. The thing about Draw Johnson, that's going to be really interesting when he's in interviews is that he has a unique perspective compared to most NFL coaches in that, he didn't follow the typical path of, okay, player, GA, or quality control guy, assistant coach, and then what have you. He was working with high school kids, doing the, the private coaching stuff. And I think because of that, has had maybe a lot more reps working with a multitude of quarterbacks than most coaches who, you know, if you're, if you're a coach that's working – just at a school, then you're going to get a few quarterbacks a year, every year. And, you know, and only so much change from year to year, which is awesome because you get to form a relationship with those kids, but you don't necessarily see this, like um, all the different issues or try different techniques or understand the different personalities and everything. So I'm really in, intrigued by Gerard Johnson having that perspective. As far as Bobby Slowick and his attention to detail, I, I've told you guys before, like to me, it's the common trait amongst really good NFL coaches is this obsessive attention to detail. Like, like in like a painstaking, annoying as hell attention to detail. And it's something that I think is missing in, in frankly, like Bill O'Brien and his approach. I think Bill O'Brien is super, super, super smart. And there's just something missing on the execution side of things because those offenses were always continually sloppy as hell. And that's where, like I, that's that's one of the things that doesn't show up in the play calling or anything, but I think was a huge part of like CJ getting better mechanically in a lot of respects is the uh, I shouldn't say mechanically, um, but there were certain things he was doing in terms of just his release and throwing off platform and everything he hadn't really seen before. I think that's a combination of Gerard and Bobby Slowick. Losing one of them would would suck, and that, that's why I hope. It, I, I would hope Bobby Slowick, if he's going to get hired, get hired faster because then maybe they elevate Gerard Johnson to offensive coordinator. Okay, uh, how they, he mentioned that he's up for all these rookie of the year honors, all that stuff, but how do you get to that next level? Yeah, I got to do way more. You know, I got to. Um... Just be me, you know. At the end of the day, I look back at it like I can say a whole bunch of cool stuff up here that'll make everybody go crazy. But honestly, I just gotta be myself, you know, and just um, work hard at that, you know, and just really do everything that uh, God put in my heart to do. And um, I just, I'm just super thankful for God, man, and, and Christ um, for really just having a rookie year like I had, you know, and uh, to be able to be mentioned with a whole bunch of greats. Um, and be playing against the greats, you know what I'm saying? So it's been just a blessing. And really my plan is just I want to be the best. You know, I don't want to just be the best rookie, the best second-year dude. I, I want to be the best, um, point blank, period. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to get going with that. And, um, yeah. I do uh, I do like that, man. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to pick on Ryan Tannehill. Uh I'm sure he can laugh about this now, but when there was hard knocks in Miami a long time ago, Ryan Tannehill's rookie year, I remember them uh who was the backup quarterback? The backup quarterback was saying something to him about the divisions in in the NFL. And Ryan just wasn't familiar with the divisions. Like he just didn't he wasn't aware of it. He just wasn't an NFL fan. Which happens like more than you might think. Guys just they go out, they play the sport, they're good at it, and they work at it, but they might not necessarily be fans of the sport. 
I think it's really cool that like CJ, CJ is a fan of these quarterbacks. So I think he does, I think he does feel like almost, it seems like he almost feels a little bit awestruck sometimes that he's, that he gets to talk to Tom Brady or that he's around these guys. Cause I mean, he learned, he learned a lot of the the way he plays football by watching YouTube of Drew Brees when he was younger, you know, like he really knows these guys and, and has studied it. And that's why, again, like compared to a lot of the guys that have the private quarterback court coaches and tutors and everything, like he's got better form and better mechanics and all those things, just because he's been working at it on his own, you know, in his mom's apartment above the storage unit, watching YouTube since he was a kid. And it's just, it's really, it's really cool to see somebody that's that, just genuinely passionate about it. Um, you've gotten a lot of accolades and support from people, but I, I don't know what I, I you might have said something about your mom. I don't I'm not sure. Man, you talk about like just genuine love, you know, she texted me something yesterday. She was like, I don't say I love you just to say it. Like I say it because I truly, like you've been one of the best things ever in my life. And I was like, wow. Like for her to like say something like that, you know, it's like, uh, it is just, like my mom is amazing. She's, she's been with me through thick and thin. We've been through a lot, a, a whole lot. And she's never ever like questioned my goals or my, like my plan. And she always like, you know what I'm saying? I'm a very independent person. She always let me be independent and like figure it out. But at the same time, I always knew if I ever needed something, I can call my mom. And I'm just super blessed to have a mother like I do. Um, blessed enough to have a father like I do. Um, my brothers, my sisters, uh, my fam, like my family back home. Um, and I'm just really, you know what I'm saying? I just, all, all in all, man, I'm just super blessed to, to be, um, where God wants me to be, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I love my mom, and I know she, they said she got a lot of camera time. So I don't think she was super happy about that. But you can see how much she prayed about me. She loves she love her son, and I love her right back. She loves all her kids, man, I, and I love her so much. Uh, okay, so I know last week, NBC – I still – I'll be honest with you guys. I still don't understand exactly what happened with the whole NBC thing, cutting out what CJ had said about uh, – CJ had um, Thank God – before his interview, but they cut that part out. I like, I don't usually, I, when it comes to things that get replayed, like we cut out 90% of an interview. So I don't know what the deal was there. I did, I felt like ESPN was almost kind of like, uh, like sticking it to NBC or something that they did like a special, they, they made sure that they, they talked about his mom praying on the, uh, praying the entire time during the game and everything. Um, they did have to cut away to go back to the, the game to show the football play. I hope, I hope that didn't distress anybody. I hope there's not think pieces out there about that. Uh, oh, okay. He said, uh, you said Will Anderson was one of the most uh, talented players you've ever been around. What is it about him that makes you say that? Uh, his mentality. Um, not only does it match up with his talent, but it probably upsees his talent. Uh, this, the 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 tenacious um, will to win, you know what I'm saying, the grit that he brings to a locker room and um, just his personality, you know what I'm saying. And, uh, his talent is, is great, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, like, if you can match that with what he has, man, it's a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the question was, what's it like knowing, I believe, uh, I believe the question was, what's it like knowing that you and D'Amico can go into this, you know, paired up as a team. It's not kind of unique to have a coach and a, a quarterback like that. It, it, I told me just a couple, like a little while ago, man, I just, I really appreciate him for the trust. Um, Cause that's one thing like in football, that's probably the main thing that you need is trust. You know what I'm saying? And I appreciate him for trusting me. And uh, uh, he knows that I trust him tremendously, tr tremendously. Any decision he makes, like, I know that it's at the, the forefront of what's best for the team. Um, and uh, I'm excited to build with him, man. I think it's going to be a great, great um, dynasty. Hopefully we build. And um, I'm excited for that. This is where, honestly, having a defensive-minded head coach, I, I think that there's a certain threshold 
where, yeah, I, I would say, look, it, it makes sense to be biased towards offense and have it be a tiebreaker and looking for a head coach. But first and foremost, you have to choose somebody who's a good, really genuinely good head coach because that offensive coordinator is only going to last a few years and you're going to be looking for the next offensive minded guy. And then all of a sudden you got a new system for your quarterback. I think once you reach a certain threshold, it doesn't matter. You know, that's where you have your Belichick's, your Tomlin's, your Pete Carroll's, uh, you know, John Harbaugh's a special teams guy. Marv Levy's a special teams guy. It, as long as you have the quarterback. Like, it's as simple as that. And then it's a matter of finding the right guys for that quarterback. And I trust D'Amico to do that, especially because they run a system that's almost a franchise by now. Like, the, the philosophy, the terminology and everything is – largely it's very common amongst all these Kubiak Shanahan guys. So there'll be tweaks and differences here and there, but um, I just want two. I just want two years. I want two years of, of CJ really understanding it. And then that way, when he works with a new offensive coordinator, if he gets two years with Bobby Slowick, um, then, you know, it's, it's more a matter of just finding the right fit. And then CJ's already his own guy. Uh, okay, so he said, um, he mentioned, you know, that CJ always says pressure is a privilege. Uh, like, how do you view the fact that this team in this city puts all that weight on your shoulders? Something, honestly, I, I, I know that's probably what it seems like, but it's not. And I'm, I'm blessed, even if it is. Um, but at the same time, like, I know God, God preparing me for stuff like that, you know, for this moment right here. Um, so I'm just, I'm really walking in my purpose. Like, um, of course I'm doing it through my passion, which is football, but, um, man, I, I'm super blessed to be able to walk through my purpose, uh, in my passion and with a great city, a great team like this. And, uh, I'm, 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 I'm super, I'm super signed up. I'm, I'm, I'm dying every, I'm dying every eye, crossing every T, um, on every contract that I got to do to, to make this team great. You know what I'm saying? And I'm super blessed to be able to, um, be with a group of guys like that. And, um, I know, but man, my teammates, like, just like it's on me, it's on all of us. You know what I'm saying? Like, they they know that. But man, I'm at the forefront of it. If that's so be it, then I'm with that. Uh, That was just them saying we're going to close with Aaron, uh, somebody then Sarge. Oh, DJ Bianca. Yeah. Uh, how important is it for you to have the off season you're going to have with somebody? It's huge. Um, Tank is my oh. brother, man. He's, uh, I don't think blood can make us any closer. Like we're really like really close. Um, and that chemistry is shown on the field and we're going to build that. You know what I'm saying? Um, we just, it's going to happen naturally. Like we just, we boys, man. You don't just, you don't force stuff with your boy, you know? So, uh, but we both are tremendously, um, uh, excited to to keep this going and work really hard to to be great and hopefully um do whatever we need to do to be great um here and we're excited for that i wonder the with tank dell look i I don't want him going in and seeking more work on the inside on goal line like he had been but i wonder if um you guys tell me does he have the frame to put on a little bit more weight like i don't you know like i don't need him to be a monster or anything i don't even have he built like tyree kill all of a sudden or or something but I wonder if just like five extra pounds uh, would make a big difference on a guy that's like his frame or not. I'd like, I'm not saying that his he had his he was landed on. It was like broke. Um, I'm probably just thinking too much about it. He'll come in like 15 pounds overweight and suck next year. And it'll be my fault. So no, it's just say the exact same tank, tank doll. I think because we know what it is. Yeah, I think he said, uh, how do you have the confidence to know that you can take the Texans where you want to go? I think because we know what it takes, you know. Um, it takes tremendous focus, tremendous uh, will to win, um, you know, stuff like that. It's all all the things that it's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do. And we did that this year, you know what I'm saying? And even though we felt we fell short, we we put that on display, 
And uh, now it's just about bringing guys here that are with that and have that same type of mentality. And whoever, and whoever stays, we keeping that standard. We ain't changing up for nobody. Um, so I think that like that is why we're confident. And man, it's okay to be confident. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't I don't look at that as a negative thing. And um, it's not cockiness. It's being confident. That's honestly, and I, I've said this a few times already, but I really believe it. Maybe because I'm saying it so much. But if they had to lose. I'm I'm glad that they played the Ravens and lost the way they did because man, like there will be zero illusion in anybody's mind about the difference between where the Ravens are right now and where and like how where the Texans need to like how far they have to go to get there. I don't in the way I phrase phrase that, I don't mean like it's this absurdly long mountain and three years or anything. It's just like every guy on that team can see, okay, that's the way this team operates, that's the way the Ravens operate. And and we just got to get to that level now. Like CJ is going to be a different type of quarterback, obviously, than Lamar Jackson. But I think defensively, especially, the they do the Ravens do a lot of stuff that D'Amico um, has done in San Francisco and wants this team to get good at. And they're just like some of the young guys. I think just needed this entire season to start to see that and understand it. And it's going to be a lot better next year. Christian Harris. Um, I think Will Anderson said that Christian Harris said something about that. Like, because uh, Christian Harris is a perfect example. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like they changed the scheme and all of a sudden Christian Harris was better. It was like a third to a half way through the season where all of a sudden it just looked like it started to click for him. So hopefully you start to get that compound effect with with guys like him. Uh, how do you feel uh, you've grown as a person away from the field, I believe? Yeah, I think I grew tremendously, man. Um, uh, a ton of great people like – I know he's going to be mad at me for this, but uh, Dylan Thompson, man. Oh, my gosh, Dylan is a, one of the best human beings I've ever met in my life. Um, just the conversations I've had with him and a lot of people like Camille, uh, who's in player development, uh, Morgan, you know what I'm saying, Amy in nutrition, Vlad, like Mike. Eubanks, like there's a ton of people, great people in this in this organization, but um, DT has been the main person, man. Just uh, you talk about like a brother, like somebody who like loves you no matter what happens on that field. Like you can feel that, you know what I'm saying. So I just appreciate. I ain't gonna be mad at me, Brett. Uh, man, he's a great great person, um, and really one of the reasons why I feel like we were very successful this year. If you were to make a pitch for the award season, what would be your season two pitch? If you were to make a pitch for, I don't know. Um, honestly, like, yeah, I, I would say, I know Will not even tripping off that. And honestly, I'm not either. Like, what? If, that's, that's for other people to figure out. But he deserves it, you know. Okay. And, yeah. I, so I think the question was um, about the question was about Will Anderson and. Does he deserve to be rookie of the year? I believe that's what the question was. Honestly, like, yeah, I, I would say, I know Will not even tripping off that. And honestly, I'm not either. Like, what? If, that's, that's for other people to figure out. But he deserves it, you know. And um, I would say that just because you look at, um, you look at how it looked in the previous years here, and you can see what the difference made of him being on the field. You can see that on how people interact with him. You can see that on how um, he talks to people in the media and like look people in the eye. You know what I'm saying? Like um, all that type of stuff, man. Like it's it's been a difference. You know what I'm saying? Like, of course, I wasn't here for those years, but like from the guys who've been here, they they can tell us like, man, you two like y'all special. So uh, I can just uh, I can say that about Will. And of course, on the field stuff, just cut the tape on. You know, you know, and even times like I said this, even we played him my freshman year in college and he might not always make the play, but he's a, one of the reasons why like, he's going to set the edge. He's going to take on a double team. He's going to make somebody miss to set somebody else up free. So it's not only just like, um, it's not always in the stats, you know what I'm saying? Like he's, he's really um, affecting the game in a lot of ways um, by just being a great player. Yeah. What's the saying? Um, damn it. What's the, dang it. What's the saying? Uh, something is production. Disruption is production, and uh, like I think that Will's that type of guy. Like he's he's very willing to go in and just.
blow up a pulling guard or do the selfless things. But it is like that. I I know I've told you guys before, but the fact that they call him the Terminator, I just thought like whatever is a cool nickname. But like the first time I saw him play and you see the way he just doesn't slow down in a kind of freakishly weird way. <laughs> like he gets hit and he just keeps moving. Like you should have like, no, you should have like, you shouldn't you should be like titanium melted and everything and then reforming and then you just keeps going just keeps going it's really cool hey Kiki, what has it been like for you to be able to just talk about just you know being you and, and doing what the focus is and just being on the platform for you to do it to be in a place where you can exhibit all that be exactly who you are and for that to be embraced talk about what that means um i think she was just i think kim was just asking just uh basically about Either the challenge or what it's like just you know, being him in the middle of all of this? Uh, it's amazing. Um, it's a blessing. Um, one of my best friends back home, his name is Baron, and uh, he always talks about um, your passion is uh, your passion is greedy, but your purpose is for others. And that's something that I, like, he hit me with that, like, my senior, I mean, my junior year in college. And since that moment, I'm like, man, like, that's how I want to live my life. I want to be at service, you know what I mean? And, uh, I've gotten a lot, a lot of great uh, people who have reached out and, and even guys after games like who are um, who just talk about like how I mentioned God and, and Christ and things like that. And I always tell people it's not it's not me. You know what I'm saying? It's him. Like It's not it's nothing I can do to ever repay what, what the Lord has done in my life. You know, and I don't want to. I just want to act in uh, what, he, what he's called me to do. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not perfect. I, I make mistakes um, every day. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I know the guy that I serve is is a forgiving and graceful God. And I, I can just appreciate that. And um, I, even like uh, Coach Harbaugh, uh, um, even saying that after the um, after they beat us, uh, you can just see like, there's a lot of us out here too that love the Lord, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And um, I, I appreciate everybody who reaches out and I'm not doing it to look cool or what I'm doing it because that's what God called me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Season like this, you know, season yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, of course I have my I think the question was, you know, you could be down at the end of a season like this or after the disappointing loss. Um, but he's he's staying positive. Where does that energy come from? I believe that was the question. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, I have my my day to soak and be like, dang, man. Like, um, at the same time, like as you soak and you look back, like it's a lot of things to be grateful for and be happy about. So um, I'm trying to just be as joyful as I can. And of course, I wish we were playing this week and I could get another game with my brothers. But uh, it's not the reality, and it's, it's nothing positive comes out of just soaking and and being in a uh, in a fog. So I mean, I just honestly, I just want I wanted to come in today and just for guys to see me like a beat, you know, I think that, um, that has, uh, a lot of weight to it. Like just guys being happy about, uh, life, you know, it's, it's a lot more to life than this game. You know, it's, it's a blessing. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's just changed my life. At the same time, I'm, I'm a person too. I'm a, I'm, I'm a regular human, just like everybody else. And I just play football on TV sometimes, you know, so, um, <laughs> but it's a blessing though. So yeah, <laughs> actually guys, I'm a, uh, let me just get this out of here. Something about what he just said there. I, you know, I've had like different types of coaches in my life. And I was always like, I always had old school coaches that wanted you to be depressed for two days after a loss. And like, <laughs> God help you if you like, God help you if you were smiling on a Monday after a loss in, in a Tom Coughlin coach team. And Capers was kind of cool about it. I, Kubiak actually uh you know was more of a hard ass about that stuff than i think people would expect and um but then i always knew and i'd heard stories about coaches like tony dungy or others where you know jeff fisher was this way that like there, there's a very strict 24-hour rule that or like a 12-hour rule that by the time you're back at work you got to be focused on the next week and if you spend any time sulking you're you're just you're being mentally weak um and it, it's it's weird it's just two different schools because i came from one school like people who i think would think of themselves as very mentally tough 
that also felt like you should sulk and you should feel awful and you should hate yourself for a while. And then another school of people who are also equally successful and, but also felt like, no, the mentally tough thing to do is to focus on the next task, you know, like what's the next mission. And I remember sitting down and thinking about it when I was first exposed to the latter part, uh, like, huh, if either can be successful, like why on earth would I choose the miserable one? I don't, I feel like I've been screwed a little bit. Like, and I also remember the same, one of the players I played with, uh, when I was younger, the guy was a stud. Um, and, uh, and I realized like, wow, he does a, he has a lot more fun playing than I do. Cause I'm always just like just gritting my jaw and just like, ah, super serious all the time. But like this other guy, like plays his ass off. It was Kyle Brady. Um, another Kyle Brady was, uh, very, very religious. Um, like, like CJ is, uh, but like being very vocal too. Like about uh, remaining celibate and stuff. It was interesting. There's a lot. Of, go Google Kyle Brady celibate and everything. Um, but he, and I'll tell him one more story. But he was like, he had a good time playing football. I'm like, yeah, I guess maybe I should be more like Kyle Brady. So Kyle, he was always like, he was publicly as a as a first round pick to the Jets. He was very public about you know saying that he withheld from sex and I, he didn't claim to be a virgin, but he said that he was celibate. And everybody just I always kind of wondered, like, I think he's a real deal. Like, I don't think he's lying about this. I don't think he's doing it just for publicity or anything. And and then so one year he got married. And previous to getting married, Kyle had hands of stone. Like he would was dropping everything all the time. He got married in like that next training camp. It was like one-handed catches, like acrobatic. He was like a he was like a like a 285-pound Odell Beckham Jr. I'm like, hey, he's telling the truth. He got married and he just like all that tension released, and the guys uh look at him now. So that's my that's my testimony. Uh Will Anderson, let me see. Oh, the heart of the servant. Yeah, the the, the biblical part of uh the servant leader. Yeah, thank you guys. I was getting education from you guys about some of it. Oh, thank you, James. Uh I was going to say James the Giant Peach because it just came to mind. It just came to mind. I'm not picking on you or anything like that. I just, my my child was in James and the Giant Peach a couple years ago. So that was the first thing I thought when I saw that. Uh, one person said, oh, somebody subbed. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And please like, subscribe, all that stuff. Um, usually these press conferences, it's almost like I use this as my rough draft for the radio show so I can figure out which sound bites I like and which ones I don't. I honestly am blown away that um, so many of you like enjoy coming here and spending time with me watching these press conferences. I, I feel like I'm your servant podcaster because uh, I don't like I don't except that I don't understand why you even want the service. It's uh, to me, it's uh, like I, 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 I don't get my appeal, but thank you. I appreciate it. Let's see. I have the Texans on exits already. Probably would have been today unless they did it yesterday. CJ said he wanted to come in today. So they may have done like the exit physicals and everything yesterday. Will and CJ and D'Amico spoke today. Um, see what a good wife can do to you. It's true, man. <laughs> Are we talking about? No, I wasn't trying to go there with CJ at all. That's no, damn it. That's a no. Clay Travis will probably ask him that at a press conference now. Yeah. Uh, that's a, for those of you who don't know, that's how the whole Tebow virginity thing got started was Clay Travis asked him that at a, at a press conference and, and Tebow, Tebow, to be clear, and I don't, I don't judge him for this. I just feel like it's I, Clay Travis asked Tebow, um, something about are you a virgin and tivo answered uh, i'm saving myself for marriage but he never actually said that he was a virgin which is fine like he may have like as a younger guy done whatever and then be like oh, okay wait you know you know people they 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 get more enlightened or awakened or however you want to phrase it and he may have like so i feel like he didn't answer it straight but people just took that and ran with it and called him a virgin and i felt bad for tivo if he wasn't a virgin because i felt like this there's a possibility that some lie was created that Tebow isn't going to want to come out and like rectify the lie by saying like, by the way, I just want to like, uh, without getting too graphic. So he was just, he was saving himself for marriage. That's good enough. My God. Stop putting so much pressure on Tebow. Damn it. No matter how much you deny it, you're charismatic, Seth. It's fun to come in here for some laughs during work. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. 
All right. Cookie Monster loves it. Signer drop Dalton. I'd say sign him because I don't think I don't think he's going to get as great a deal. <sighs> it's tough. I, I like Dalton a lot, and I was skeptical early on because he was having a hard time. He was having a hard time getting on the same page with um, with CJ, but it started being really good. He had those two curious drops in the last two games, and I don't know what where that came from. Uh, but I like him, and I think that he's already felt that sting of going out on the free agency market and not getting what he thought he was going to get, perhaps. You know, uh, uh, he was projected to to get a $40, $50 million contract. And in lieu of an offer like that, he signed with the Texans, who at the time, remember, didn't have C.J. Stroud. So I, I wonder if having felt that sting and knowing that he's a fit here and that he and C.J. can only grow together – in the Texans, maybe, you know, knowing that, boy, if they lose Dalton, they've got Brevin. And I like some of the things Brevin does, but he's not a complete tight end. Um, that it makes a lot more sense to sign. It's, it makes a lot more sense to sign Schultz instead of just roll the dice and burn a first or second round pick on a tight end. Um, this is what I want to do here. I'm going to play. Um, I actually reacted to. What is that? What would you rather do? Okay. I actually reacted to um, Will Anderson earlier. I recorded it, but I'll play it here and um, and I'll monitor in the comments. I hope that's not too disingenuous because somebody might come on and see that. Ah, whatever. I'm playing a video because um, I don't think it's too long, but it's awesome. Like it's really good. Will Anderson was really, really good. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow along in the comments while we're, uh, while we're going, but it was, he was just awesome. I love that kid, man. Let's see. Will Anderson. Will Anderson, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Will Anderson, who had a very promising rookie year, was promising right from the get-go versus the Ravens. He got that sack multiple pressures. Wasn't getting necessarily sack production initially, but was affecting the quarterback a lot. Was getting double-teamed a lot, commanding a lot of double-teams, and uh, has a, just a delightful personality, as we all know. So here's Will Anderson. Again, uh, for those of you new to the channel, it's really hard to hear the Texans' questions, the reporters' questions at Texans press conferences sometimes. So I will try to recap them as best as I can hear them. Yeah, I'll start with the team first, man. How y'all doing today? Will, how proud are you of the team's season and yours and what areas you're looking to get better in? Yeah, I'll start with the team first, man. Uh, bro, right. special group, special, special, special group, man. It was very emotional. And it's so different from college, man, because I just keep – all I keep hearing is this group not going to be the same. It's going to be a different team next year. And it's just like you form these bonds with these guys and the togetherness of the team, and you get to know why people play football, what's their, what's their reason, like how they operate, everything like that. And then just off the field, building those bonds, it's just hard. You know what I'm saying? I wish everybody could come back, man. But, bro, the success that we had this year is just a testament to everybody in this building, from the locker room to the training staff to nutritionists to Coach Ryan's, Nick, um, Cal, all the guys that play a part. And this last season that we just had, man. So it's just a special team, man. And then for me, man, it's never being satisfied. Always room for improvement. But, um, you know, I am proud of some of the things I did, the growth, the maturity, um, learning different ways to play the game of ball, learning from great vets like Rank, Jerry Hughes, JG, all those guys in the room, Coach Jock, Coach Rod, just got to give a big shout-out to the whole D-line always, the whole room, the coaches. Like, we transformed that whole room together, the work ethic, the mindset, the mentality, like everybody just coming together and just wanting to do something special and um, make history. So um, it's just always room for improvement, always room to get better. And, and I think just one thing for me is just, you know, just keep working on pass rush, keep getting better at run game, all those type of things, getting better. So it's exciting. Uh, the, okay, so that very first thing that he mentioned, the the fact that guys leave and you form these bonds, and, and then you have to form new bonds with the new guys the next year. Like that very challenge is the very thing that guys like Will Anderson are the remedy for. Like that kind of energy and that willingness to do it and to want to create those bonds, and especially if he can be your, you know, one of your very best players, goes a long, long way in an NFL locker room. There's a there's a huge advantage 
to having that kind of atmosphere on a team because you just simply don't get it. It doesn't just happen naturally the way it happens in college. I will say, uh, like, for the longest time, and I've heard it's still this way, the, the Ravens themselves are really good at cultivating that kind of atmosphere. And I don't know if it's Harbaugh, but it was, you know, it, before Harbaugh, it was Billick, and, like, they've always had that reputation of being a close-knit team. Buffalo has been like that as well. And it, the, the biggest challenge for the Texans, I swear to you, is geography. Like the fact that guys are so spread out from, you know, Sugarland to Pearland to Memorial and everything, it makes it tougher uh, for, for everybody to kind of get together. And uh, like it's, I've, I've had, uh, I've had, uh, I've had focus groups talk about this before. We task action groups and um, we haven't come up to a solution. I, I believe Will Anderson's energy could be the solution. And also, honestly, like CJ is a guy that, okay, CJ invites all different guys to dinner from all over the team. And that's not something that might sound simple, but that's just not, it's not common. It's pretty cool. Courage, are you glad the, for the future of this team after what you guys were able to do this year? I'm very encouraged. And it's easier to hear these questions, but just in case, uh, she said, How encouraged are you by what the team was able to do this year? The for the future of this team after what you guys were able to do this year? I'm very encouraged. And it's crazy because me and Christian was just talking. He was like, Bro, like, I don't like understand like I don't think people understand how much better we're gonna be next year. It's so easy to come into this place and really just connect with the guys in here and you know, be able to come in a culture that's been built here and you know how to operate throughout that culture. And it's just all mindset and mentality. And then just the players that we have to go out there and execute and have fun doing it. I think that's the biggest thing. It's just everybody's loving what they're getting a chance to do. Everybody coming together and just keep trying to make history and keep getting this place better. So Christian Harris, I'm glad I'm glad that you mentioned talking to Christian Harris and Christian Harris's optimism towards next year because Christian's the epitome of a guy that just he he changed 180 degrees. I was growing pessimistic that Christian was going to be able to fulfill his physical potential. I just didn't I didn't know if he had it, you know? Like I didn't even know if he just had if it was going to click for him and a third of the way through the season it clicked for him. So, yeah, if you compound changes like that and and I'm really honestly I'm glad the Texans played the Ravens and I'm glad that they like if they had to lose, I'm glad they got beat the way they did because there's so much about that team that does things the way you're supposed to do it, especially defensively. So a lot of the things that D'Amico wants to do, disguising these coverages, have your safeties be able to both disguise, but you know, play the run up front, but also play a deep third, do all these things. It's it's you need you need to understand how to get there and where to get there. And they've got their San Francisco teaching tapes, but you could see it in that game on Saturday night, exactly what they want to be. And I think now this first full season, guys have a better feel for what D'Amico wants and where they need to go to get there and, and just make it more naturalized. So I would, I share their optimism, especially about the defense offensively. We've got, we've got things we can discuss all this week on where they need to improve. Um, defensively, they need to improve a lot on personnel side, but I think, I think the core guys like, Will Anderson and Christian Harris. I feel very, very good about them for the future. You talk about, uh, you, you talk about a, a lot about your teammates, but can you just talk about what that bond that you and Jonathan Bernard developed over this year? I mean, you're going to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he asked about the bond between him and Jonathan Bernard. What does it mean to you to have a person like that uh, around? Man, it's 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 been unbelievable. Like JG's a great guy, man. Like going to his house for Thanksgiving. Out, go out to eat all the time. Up here, laughing, joking around, and it's, it's it's for me one of the things that like I got to be myself. Like I just got to be childish little Will in the room, be the young rook, have fun, make outbursts sometimes, just to like lighten the room up and everything like that. And man, JG's been a great vet for me, man. Like he's been such a help this year, and just watching him grow and l watching him receive all the blessings that he's been, you know you know, that he deserves everything like that he's been through. Um, his testimony has been strong, bro. He's been so uplifted, positive about everything. And just to see the type of season he's had, like I told him all the time, I said, bro, like, forget the f first round pick, everything. Like, bro, I feed off you, dog. Like, bro, you're, you're, you're inspiring for me, bro. Like, I see the juice that you bring every day, the, the, the type of competitor you are, how bad you really want to be great, bro. And we all feed off of that. And he just brings the type of energy and type of juice to the room that's unmatched. I thought he was going to drop an F bomb there. Uh, and I also could, I'm glad there was a K there. I kept thinking it was that his shirt said slut or something like that. It doesn't. That'd be very out of, out of character for Will to wear a slut shirt into the.
It'd be funny though. Um, it, I'm glad you mentioned the meeting rooms too. There's, that's one thing to adjust to. In college, you have very limited time for meetings. In the NFL, you have all freaking day. And that's an adjustment for guys. I and mean, I don't know how Jacques Desire handles the meetings, but if you get a coach that just wants to take – take a bunch of us defensive linemen that are either diagnosed or undiagnosed, like I'd say 90% of us ADHD and stick in, stick us in a dark room for two hours. Good luck to you. Um, but it's an adjustment. It's an adjustment. We have a conversation you'll have more in the off season, but throughout the year, like coming into the year, there weren't a lot of expectations for the Texans. Free agents didn't know what they were getting from CJ or D'Amico. The guys in the league come up to you and say, man, like you guys are, Doing something serious over there. Have people taken notice of other players? Most definitely, like uh, have people taken notice of what you guys are doing as a team? Players? Most definitely, like um, um, Jadavian Clowney came up to me last game. Miles Garrett came up to me last game. Josh Allen came up to me last game, and it's just like, bro, like y'all doing something special over there, bro. Like just keep going, keep being a leader, keep changing the culture over there. Like y'all guys, like the young guys over there are special, everything like that. So just to see that, you know, people are starting to recognize it, man. But it really just a testimony to the guys that we have in the in the in the in the locker room. You know what I'm saying? Like how we can buy in and know like what type of culture needs to be in order to be successful. Clowney's coming back. <laughs> okay, Clowney, look, man. I, I love Clowney. Even when I got frustrated with Clowney at times, I love him. He's playing great for Baltimore. Talked about this earlier. He's he's. People have said, why is he, why wasn't he like this with Houston? He was actually better for a three-year stretch in Houston than he's been with Baltimore this year. And he's been really good with Baltimore. He just doesn't have the baggage of being a number one overall pick. So, uh, and then he's playing. I think I think Clowney looks at D'Amico and probably thinks, wow. That's a, that's a much different scenario than it was under Bill O'Brien. Remember the time Bill O'Brien tried to get tried to get Clowney to sign his franchise tag so he could trade him to Miami? And Clowney was like, well, no. Hey, just come on in and sign the tag and we can talk. Just, just come in like it was a mob hit or something. And Clowney, to his credit, was smart enough to figure out, like, no, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dictate terms on this. It ended up going off to Seattle. Yeah, uh, I'm guessing you guys can hear this. They fixed something. You met Ray Lewis before the last game. What was that conversation like? I met him before. Um, it was um NFL rookie P, uh, premiere. Uh, like it was like who your favorite player is, and Ray Lewis was my favorite player growing up because I I played inside linebacker when I was in little league, and we've just formed that bond. You know what I'm saying? And for him to come up to me before the game, whatever like that, and he told me he loved me and good luck with everything. And you know, if I ever need anything, you know, reach out to him. You know, he's been great, you know what I'm saying? And to share moments like that with uh, – I call him the goat of linebackers, man. He's a special player. But when you just recognize, like, yeah, people like that in your corner, you know, it just makes you want to keep going. I thought – I wonder if mm – -hmm. You guys will remember this better than I do. Wasn't there a – there was some kind of a rookie premiere thing where somebody gave – like, one of an old – an old NFL great wrote something to young players. And so Will Anderson was a part of that. I don't remember if it was Ray Lewis or not. Let me, let me look. Let me look this up right now. Hall of Famer Ray Lewis fires up rookie linebacker Will Anderson Jr. Yeah, they posed for an autograph together. So there we go. Okay. Will's not lying. Yeah, that was like one of the biggest like. Okay. Uh, that one. He asked, "What was the biggest stride you made in understanding stuff?" Where was the biggest stride you made? Yeah, that was like one of the biggest like like increases in my game as the season kept going on and it's kind of different in college because the weight like our scheme was so like things were a little different so like when i got here it's like it was a little slower process and then like as the season go on and i'm saying like we have vets like rank i know I'm, i just love talking about these guys because i don't think people understand how special they are but we got guys like rank and jg and jerry who knows the system and knows how offenses work you know they point out so many things i'm like bro I didn't even notice that, like, the back over there, the back's going to do that, and it's so crazy. Like, this tackle showing you this. And I would say, like, that's how my game was taken to the next level, like the second half of the season, just by recognizing those little things. Okay, that's really cool. Like, honestly, that that's awesome for Rankins and Collins because when you sit with young guys and watch film with them, it really – like, there's stuff that – there's stuff that sometimes you know that you don't even realize other people don't know, and sometimes you don't realize that the coach doesn't know himself. Um, but it also – it also – just helps the younger guys when they hear it from a player who's playing next to them. Um, Cause there are, there's so many things you can pick up 
that uh, in so many things you you need to understand about what the offense is trying to do to you that you learn over time and it's an older vet that teaches you i still remember the guys the guys that were i was i was lucky when i was a rookie ronaldo win and i were both draft picks and we had a bunch of old school veteran players that were like they hazed the hell out of us but they also just i, I learned i learned so much so like that that way he feels about them like i'll i'll get teary-eyed thinking about how much those guys helped me as a rookie from college to that point was the biggest yeah, I would just. So, what was the biggest recommendation, maybe from those guys, in going from the college to the pros? Say the the scheme, as far as noticing things were a little different and how they were using me, so it wasn't quite the same where I had to look at now than what I had to look at in college. I think, yeah, and uh, you know, I think over the second course of the second half of the season, too, you know, he's talked about understanding the angles better, understanding just like how much you can help yourself either in your pass rusher versus the run with your alignment, you know, and you tweak your alignment based on, based on the offense, all that stuff. He just got a lot better at, and he got a lot better at anticipating certain things, you know, chip blocks specifically, but other stuff too. It just, it came to him a lot more naturally. So it's, um, it's really cool to see like just some of the, the little nuances of playing the position that, that, that don't show up on the stats or anything. He just, he got way more comfortable with it. And I'll just say, honestly, like early in the season, he was kind of, there were times where just, just by virtue of which direction he headed on his pass rush um, or the angle that he lined up at, he was hurting himself. And there's no way you would know that he was hurting himself until those guys kind of helped him and worked him into where it's just, it's just so more, much more efficient right now. And I'll use the, I, I continue to use honestly the weird the weird comp that I always think of with him is Nick Bosa and maybe it's just because because Nick Bosa plays in this same system that D'Amico came from but they they're like combo strength speed guys neither their speed Bosa's strength is pretty damn impressive <laughs> um but he's bigger than than Will but neither of them are like the fastest guys on earth um, and Bose is not like the biggest, strongest. He's not as like a powerful as a, a JJ Watt or somebody like that. Uh, but it's the combination of those two things when you tie it all together that kind of like a Michael Strahan it ends up can do some really, really cool things, especially because with Will, he, he gives a damn about stopping the run. He's not just selfish and in it just for sacks. He, he actually really gives a damn about stopping the run. Did he say one of the main reasons why you wanted to come here was Coach Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what has it been like working with him? How has he kind of like exceeded the expectations? Bro, um, oh, what's it been like working with D'Amico Ryan's? Overly exceeded them, overly. And I don't usually rank my all the head coaches I've ever had, <laughs> but man, he show up there. I tell you, bro, like he got he might be number one, bro. Over Coach Saban, dog, like, bro, like. <laughs> oh, this is already a headline. <laughs> That, Bro, but, uh, <laughs> that's already a headline somewhere. Man, the man just retired. The man just retired, Will. Oh. <laughs> but no, nah, man, he's he's just a great dude. He's a really great dude. And I tell people all the time, he say, hi, Coach Ryan. I said, Bro, honestly, bro, like, I view him as a coach, but I also view him as a player. Like, I view him still as, like, he's just a captain on the team sometimes because that's the way he approaches us. Like he approaches us, like he still is playing the game. And, like, and I think that's why it's so easy for all of us to like comprehend and understand like how he operates and what he wants to get done. Cause he commands that type of, you know, excellence and expectation and standard through everybody throughout the whole organization. And I mean, when you have a head and he's like, he's like, co like he can coach you, you know what I'm saying? Like he knows, like he's been, the, he's been in the league. He knows, and he knows how to coach. And that's the thing, another thing that I respect about him, man. Like the way he cares about his players, the way he loves his players, he wants it so bad. He just gives all that love and energy into his players. And I know it just makes us want to keep playing for him. I, you know, one thing when he talks about that, like, okay, you can coach, you know, you think, oh, yeah, he's a defensive coach. You know, of course he knows. Like, it's important that, okay, he, he was a linebacker and he's a defensive coach, but he's a linebacker's coach. The first guy I think of whenever somebody talks about coaching the other positions is Bill Belichick, because like Bill Belichick at any given point can go around the field and probably is the best position coach at any spot on the defense. Offensively, I don't know. I I feel like sometimes it's overblown a little bit, maybe with offensive line especially. Um, but Belichick's ability to coach the coaches has always been the most impressive to me. I think uh, like not coach head coaches. He's just awful at that for some reason, but he can coach the hell out of a position coach. And 
Um, I, that's, I, I could totally see D'Amico being that guy, like having that technical expertise in all aspects. And then that's, that's, then you can help those, not just the players, but you can help those assistant coaches through their problems they have too. Mm-hmm. How do you feel like you've grown as a man this season? How do you feel like you've grown as a man this season? Yeah. Um, honestly, I would just say my faith, like just getting closer to God. I know I talked to y'all after like the Jets game, whatever, like that and the Titans game. And it's so many people I want to give a shout out to, but Dylan, our player personnel guy, and Coach Rod, our assistant D-line coach, those two guys have been such a blessing in my life and helping me grow as a man off the field and helping me be closer to God and understanding his word and knowing how special he is and how much grace and mercy that he has over our lives. And man, like, it's so crazy that the way God works and the way that you know, God will bring people in your life to help you go close to him and put you in situations to know that I always got my hand on you. And that's just one area of my life where as a man, I feel like I've really taken that next step. It's, you know, it's trials and tribulations and this type of game, you know, people always say, you got to please this person. No, all in person, I got to please this God. That's the only person I need approval from is God. And, you know, I think that's just one step of many of just keep becoming a better man and keep becoming a better player. Oh, NBC cut that part out already. Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, he, he talked about that when uh, the couple weeks that he was out. He re- that was one of the things he really mentioned. Uh, it felt like he did take a, a step forward personally, almost, and in, in having that kind of adversity. And you know, it, you know, it wasn't like uh, you know, you know like life threatening adversity or anything. But just it, it sounded like he he leaned on his faith to help him through that, and maybe in a way that he hadn't done before. I like. It, I'll let him speak about his faith. I'm not going to read into it. Uh, but he mentioned Dylan, Dylan Thompson, the director of team development. And he was brought in. That is, I will I will concede as a guy that was very critical of Jack Easterby. Easterby did do some good things for the organization. Easterby had some really good ideas. He just, he wanted to implement all of them all at once, uh, no matter what it took. But he did have some really good ideas. And he did some like with the player program stuff and everything, uh, and the, a lot of the subs as they used to call them. Like they 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 did they kind of modernized and advanced the organization in a lot of ways. And apparently, hiring Dylan was a, a good thing. Okay, so that's a good way to frame that. Say so, uh, people are going to be up for various awards in the next few weeks. Uh, I know you don't like talking about yourself. What's the case for your teammates? Yeah, I, I have no doubt that he shouldn't be the uh, offensive rookie of the year. I mean, what he's done, I, like I feel like people who know ball know ball. What he's done, came into an organization who wasn't good last year, came in as a rookie, changed the whole trajectory of this team, leader, captain as a rookie, passing yards, all these records he set, the man he is, the um, the player he is, the type of teammate he is, it just speaks volume to him and his family. You know what I'm saying? I know he's strong in his faith, but uh, when you watch CJ play, you don't see a rookie on the field. When you see CJ walk through the building, you don't see a rookie. When you see him interacting with people, you don't see a rookie. You see a guy who comes to work every day who's about his business and just wants to make others around him better. I'll tell you, you know, the guys that I keep thinking of is a, is a – Listen to D'Amico. I listen to Will. Uh, you know, I've listened to CJ all year long, and and a few other of these guys. There, I try to think of Dan Campbell. Like Dan Campbell, different type of energy, but still an energy. You know, and you can tell that it's good. Like Dan's Dan's way more just kind of just rough and uh, rough and tumble, and like and rough around the edges maybe, but like still a good energy. He has a little bit more of a barroom brawler mentality maybe, um, but just a, like an awesome energy. And that's I don't I don't know if I've ever been on or covered a team that has quite so many guys that really seem to be like, oh wow, this guy's like a, just a genuinely really good dude, and he's also like the top draft pick or the head coach or something like that. And um, it's really cool. It's really cool. It's really, it's fun and exciting. Catch it. Catch me now when I'm still naive and young and, uh, and not wise to the world. I'm as cynical as they come and I'm feeling that way because some of you guys must be bursting at the seams. Yeah, I was crying after the game and he wasn't crying. So, and he came. To- okay. I'll have to play the question there. I, I, I saw this earlier talked about. Okay, so what were your what have your conversations with CJ been like? Yeah, I was, oh, since the game was played. Okay, I was crying after the game, and he wasn't crying. So, and he came. He said, "You good? We good?" 
we straight. We gonna we gonna be good next year. And I'm like, <laughs> my bad. Cap said we gonna be good next year. <laughs> so I I draw my tears up, man. And I, I just looked at it from his perspective that he gave me after we talked. And he was just like, bro, like just think about how much we've come from, like how much better we're gonna be next year, bro. Like we're headed in the right direction. Uh, oh, man, that's funny. That last part. My wife loves Will Anderson, and that was before she ever saw any uh any any clips of him or anything she's just she's a coach and she she was just watching him play she's like i love that kid like why is he he's just he's always going he's so, like she loves him uh and so like and and i told her i was like i know i know he's just like he never stops moving he's just always and he's super positive all the time you'd love to coach that kid What's the thing you will most take away from your first season in the NFL? <sighs> I really just don't take no no moment for granted. No person, no play, no day, anything for granted. Like, every day, make sure you're getting something out of every day. Like, it can be taken away from you as fast as it was given to you. You know what I'm saying? So, I think that's just one thing. And then just watch other players and everything like that. Like, how fast this game can be taken away from you. So, just take it for granted. Take advantage of every opportunity you have, every conversation you have just walking by somebody speak, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's one of the biggest things is just how are you treating others around you? So those are the type of things that I've taken from this year. And don't take no shit from nobody. I'm sorry. JJ Watt and Mario Williams are the greatest pass rushers in team history. You had more sacks than they did as a rookie. And then their second year, their careers took off double digits in seven years. How encouraged are you about how much better you can be next season? Okay, so J.J. Watt and Mario Williams, uh, both the two best pass rushers that the Texans have had, and Will had more sacks than both of those guys their rookie year. Um, what are you What are you thinking about for next year? Uh, let's point out Mario Williams did have plantar fasciitis real bad his rookie year that limited him. And J.J. You know J.J. J.J. himself. I asked J.J. what he would do differently. Uh, if he could redo his rookie year. And he said, maybe not suck for so much of it because he, he felt like he didn't really get good until towards the end. Yeah, very encouraged, man. It's, it's it's awesome just to see the growth so far and everything like that. But for me, it's just staying focused and staying the course and running my own race. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, can't get caught up in what everybody else did and just running Will Anderson's race and just keep better and keep growing and, you know, just keep being a leader, keep being a captain and, you know, just making sure that I'm staying focused and staying what I need to do. But it's very encouraging. I know the system now. I know how Coach Ryan's won everything, um, Coach Jock, Coach Rod, how they coach it. So it's going to be very exciting. I can't wait for next year. I would have liked it if just, you know, now that he's taken down Nick Saban a notch or two, if he just said, hey, those guys are yesterday. This is today. Will Anderson's going to be Will Anderson. Sorry. Will, a lot of people have seen how you are. Uh, the Ravens have changed the culture as far as the team is concerned on the field. Can you talk about off the field? I think in your loss, rookie group text, you said that we want to change the culture, not just on the field, but around. Yeah. Okay, so um, he talks about changing the culture. Could you talk about how not just on the field, but off the field, perhaps you've changed the culture? Around the field. Yeah. Everybody, you see yeah. 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 Man, sorry, sir. Those are just the little things, man. Those, and I think, you know, people get wrapped up and go on a little rant right quick. Players and get everything get wrapped up in wanting approval. And I don't think it's wanting approval. I think it's just wanting love, wanting to be showing the same love as everybody. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I know as us rookies talk about is, bro, like, it's not approval. It's not. It's just love. Just let's just go show love. Let's just have energy. Let's just wherever we walk by, whether it's a nutritionist, custodian, security guard that's at the front. Like, how can we make them feel love for coming here, working for the Texans, the stadium, everything like that? So no matter who it is, and that's how you change the culture. That's how you get everybody, you know, wanting to be a part of something special. Like they just probably over there just standing around, but you come in and you say, "Hey, how you doing today? I hope you have a great day." Now they look forward to coming back to work. You know what I'm saying? I think it's the same thing in the locker room. Like, that person may not be feeling the love. What's up, bro? You good? How you doing today? You good? Like, workers may, may have to be, be down. You don't know. And I think that's just one thing that's how you change a culture is just speaking to everybody, making everybody feel love, no matter what your status is, no matter what your rank is. We're all in this together. We're all trying to change the culture. We're all trying to win. So just be as one. And we'll have fun doing it, man. Will, Will, like Will Anderson's parents are like, they did a freaking good job of that kid, man. Like that, that's all. Yeah, nails. And uh, like, it, it's funny. There are some guys. I think there's some guys that really don't realize 
necessarily uh, that they that they come off as aloof, um, especially when it comes to the support staff around the building and around the team, uh, because they're just kind of their own. They're in their own little worlds and they've got tunnel vision and they don't even necessarily realize that they're part of a larger organization. And I don't know if see, I don't know if um, I don't know if D'Amico has talked with them about that specifically or not. You know, I, you know, I, Tom Coughlin um, was was that way. Like he wanted people to be sure that they understand understood they were part of a, a larger organization. And it's just it's really cool for a rookie to get that and feel that. It's just um, it's just good. It's good child rearing, I think. Thank y'all. I appreciate y'all. I, I appreciate you, Will. Yeah. Uh, in the comments, the, uh, like, it's impossible to not like that kid. He's so like energetic and wholesome and pure, but not cheesy. It's hard to be wholesome and pure and energetic and not incredibly cheesy. I'm sorry. Any of you that are wholesome and pure and energetic, there's a good chance you're cheesy. It's hard not to be if you're that pure of soul and heart, you know, but, uh, Will Anderson manages not to do it. Helps to be an awesome football player. I think. That goes a long way towards it. Um, yeah, the Dylan, uh, Dylan, oh, is it Thomas? No, that's the poet, Dylan Thompson. Um, got a shout out from CJ too. I for, thank you. I forgot that that's who he was talking about. And I blanked when uh, CJ was done talking about him. But um, they, they seem to really be a big fan of him. Player program guy is very important. <clears throat> Which reminds me, JJ Moses has a book out. I'm supposed to interview him at some point. So there's a guy that's, you know what? He's pure of soul and super energetic and not cheesy either. All right. I think I actually know quite a few of those people now that I think about it. I got to count my blessings, not my curses more so. Um, I'm, I'm going to get going because it's been like two hours now. And I'll, I'll cut these up into more manageable things. But I also want to look at, oh, no. Oh, boy. Uh, was CJ, was rookie CJ Stroud really ready for the playoffs? And this is one Cameron Newton. All right, we'll watch this. We got to watch this. I'm going to see. I bet I bet that's a very – that's one of those – is a picture of Cam. Okay, anyway, let's, let's, let's show this. I got to get better at the sharing of screens so I don't waste everybody's time. All right. It's going to be <laughs> oh, what's Cam going to say? This is going to make Sports Center. I bet he's positive on it. The title is Was Rookie CJ Stroud Really Ready for the Playoffs? Let's see. Is it sharing it? No, not yet. There we go. I got to keep an eye. Okay. All right. The title is, was rookie CJ Stroud really ready for the playoffs? Here we go. Fourth down. Wholesome moment of the week. As I like to call it, one finger, one pinky, one thumb, the one love award. Who we got? None other than CJ Stroud. Yeah. Let's see what he's talking about. Young man, young man, young man. Welcome to the playoffs. How does that sound to you? Man, it's a blessing. I can't do nothing but just thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, man. I'm sorry. I put a lot of work in. My team that has everybody counting us out from the from the start. So, man, it's just special to see the city of Houston just on to come up again. And um, I'm just blessed enough to be the vessel that that Christ picked to to lead this great franchise. Yeah. So I can do nothing but just thank the Lord. Yeah, that's for sure. Cause. Not even me. All right, let me hold myself. Yeah. I didn't believe in the ass. Okay, so I wonder when this was. This might have been just after the last uh, last week. Like Texans? Shit, it was going to take about two or three years. For them to get it right. You know what I'm saying? But shit, they don't <clears throat> figure. They got their guy. They got their trigger man. Yeah. And they balling too. Okay. They selling out for them. Okay, yeah. So this was, uh, this is a little bit old. So of course he was ready there after this. God, I wish I could dress like that. They are. Uh, that motherfucker had some throws, bro, where it was just like. For real? <laughs> damn. And when it's time for him to make plays, he's making plays. He's giving guys opportunities. And that's all you can ask for. And. You don't have that excuse no more to say, oh, he young. Like this guy came in 
defying all odds that was posed against him. Coaches too. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because like, they was knocking him off the IQ test when he was coming in and saying. Not an IQ test, but yes. That shit ain't fucking football. Like, stop nah, doing that shit. Facts. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Can you play or not? <laughs> At the end Line of the it day. Up. Like, shit. I don't know two plus two, but I know how to embarrass you. <laughs> I do. Okay. This is something. Uh, like, it, it's weird. I, I'm, I'm stuck in this spot where I want. I know people are defending CJ Stroud, and yet they're they're classifying the S2 as an intelligence test, which it's not at all. And even if it were, it would still be invalid. And yet, like by planning, I, I, like people don't need that seed planted that, oh, CJ did poorly on an intelligence test, even if they consciously believe that it doesn't matter anyway. It's just like I like it's not an intelligence test that he was bad at. I, he may have a genius level IQ when it comes to intelligence tests. It's it's an S two cognition test, which is all this different visual functioning stuff and everything. So anyway, as he as he is defending uh, as he is defending C J Stroud though, otherwise, You're like oh shit, we want a very smart. Player. You don't want no fucking smart player. You want a good football player. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Be smart on the field. Yeah, like, come on. Smart bro. on the field. Yeah. CJ Stroud, bro, I'm extremely proud of your ability to to come into it to a league and really get everybody's attention. He did. Uh, is it is it over with for him? No, nah, because the playoffs brings a different type of speed, energy, and competitiveness where every play counts. It okay. So ain't this, no more. So this is updated then since the loss. Oh semi sold out yeah like this shit every game count it's the last from one. from fucking warm-ups pre-game to it's a different type of energy bro yeah and you got to be ready to rock and roll but needless to say like cj bro you've you, you've conquered a lot and it and it's it's not that you did it keep doing what you're doing mm-hmm. because a lot of people are taking notice you're setting the bar <laughs> like game changer okay people are going into the draft saying oh i gotta find me another cj Stroud." thanks that's what a game changer is mm. feel me so yeah big ups to you and the one love award goes to cj Stroud and the houston texans yeah so congrats. thank you cam your validation means a lot uh i wonder honestly i wonder when that was that was weird it was weird that i don't think he mentioned the that was eight hours ago so I wonder if they talked a little bit more about that about in the short clip because as far as like the actual performance um, in that game, it's it's not man, it's not his fault. It's just unfortunate that he ended up he ended up looking more like a rookie in that game than he has in a long time. Um, like it was, and this is what happens in the playoffs. Everything Cam said is true. This is what happened like to a young Lamar Jackson before he was put into the right system. Um, that's what happened, like, because that was a different scenario altogether. That offense was incredible. They were incredible in the regular season. But when you get to the playoffs, that Greg Roman system didn't give didn't give Lamar Jackson um really enough options to to counterbalance you know what teams would load up against plus the the talent wasn't as good on the receiving core too and he was younger then too he just wasn't he wasn't the same guy he is now he hadn't learned as much about the nfl um with cj i think the the very apparent thing was that the group around him still needs upgrading you know one of those things hopefully is tank dell being back but when you're facing a team like the ravens who were just so solid throughout defensively and were able to rush the passer as well as they were um, and really just like uh, they, they confused the hell out of that offensive line. Not to mention, man, I like, okay, let's be honest. I, the offensive line just completely lost it with the crowd noise. I, they had, they had, was it six pre-snap penalties in the first quarter? I keep feeling like I'm saying the wrong stat, and yet I'm pretty sure it was six pre-snap penalties in the first quarter. It was at least five. My God, it was just a mess. And it got to the point where CJ looked like even sometimes with a four-man rush where previously he would have stepped up in the pocket um, or worked towards the line of scrimmage. He was bailing out to the right, you know, turning it into a half field. And against that defense, it's just not going to work. So it was 
I, I'll say this 18 million times probably this offseason. I'm glad he saw that. I'm glad that the offense saw it. Um, you know, the, I'm glad the rushing offense, you know, if they had to lose, saw exactly what they're up against. And that, yeah, like Casario knows it. They got to bolster the offense. They got to put some more support around CJ. But yeah, the, like all in all, man, couldn't have been a better rookie season. The penalties, my God. <laughs> It said, it, oh, okay, so Chill Out says it was from a couple weeks ago. That's what it seems like. Maybe, oh, they just posted the short like eight hours ago then, I guess. All right. That makes more sense. Thank you. Thank you, Chill Out. Chill Out or Chilly Out? Chill Out. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everybody. It's been two hours. My God. Uh, please like, subscribe, tell a friend. I meant to do a reaction to the highlights. I'll do that tomorrow. And uh, I'm going to try to do it for every divisional game. So a reaction to the highlights uh, tomorrow, as well as some more some substantive football talk about the offseason and what's to come and everything. Uh, I got to do a lot of research now. I got to start studying for the draft. I got to start studying these free agents. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, at some point talk to my wife. Probably like right now. All right, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot for hanging out. Really appreciate it. Thank you.